Gunaiden. Good morning. Hosh Gelden is welcome. I won't continue uh, doing two languages, but uh, a, a very warm welcome to all of our esteemed guests here today from Istanbul, from elsewhere in, in Turkey, and from elsewhere uh, around the region and, and world. Uh, my name is Chris Roosevelt, and I'm the director of the Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations, or ANAMED, as we call it. And so it's my uh, duty and pleasure um, to welcome you here today uh, for what, as you can see in alternating slides on the screen, uh, is the 14th International ANAMED Annual Symposium which, judging from the program and the turnout this morning already, will serve as an important forum for discussion of conservation, preservation, education, and many other issues surrounding heritage and world heritage sites located primarily in Turkey, but of course with farther reaching implications. For those of you unfamiliar with Anamed, let me begin by explaining that Anamed is an integral part of Coach University. It was founded in 2005 with a mission to foster research on the archaeology, the architecture, the art. Can you hear me now? Hello. Uh, it was founded in 2005 with a mission to support the uh, study of the archaeology, the art, the history, uh, the architecture, that is the, the cultural heritage uh, of Anatolia. Uh, and we realized this mission in a number of ways most obviously in this context, with a number of workshops and symposia each year, uh, the, uh, in addition to our main event, which is this uh, annual symposium. Additionally, we run summer programs and training workshops on various aspects of Anatolian civilizations. We provide year-round research library services with a growing collection managed in connection with the independent collections of the American Research Institute in Turkey the Turkish Institute of Archaeology, and the Netherlands Institute in Turkey. We provide residential fellowships for between 30 and 40 scholars each academic year, and we organize exhibitions and publications that further our aims of making the rich history of Anatolian civilizations better known to a wide public. While here for this symposium, you shouldn't miss Anamed's two current but soon closing exhibitions, Archival Memories, Marcel Restley's Research in Anatolia and Beyond, which is in our main exhibition space accessed via the lobby, and Picturing a Lost Empire, an Italian lens on Byzantine art and in Anatolia, which is in our arched gallery just one floor up. Similarly, uh, I encourage you to visit the non Anamed exhibition, but still worthy exhibition, that is just down the street at the Yapakredi Culture and Arts Center called Meanwhile in the Mountains, Sagalassos, which features a site on the tentative list of UNESCO's World Heritage Center, about which we'll soon hear more from Ebru Torun, to whom we're very grateful for her participation here today. Finally, uh, if, you've, uh, al if you haven't already visited the Coach University Press bookshop and other bookseller exhibits accessed in the lobby, uh, please do so to peruse, if not also to purchase, the two volumes associated with uh, these uh, the two volumes associated with these Anamed exhibitions, as well as our, our newest book, the publication of the 2016 Annual Symposium on Sacred Spaces and Urban Networks, edited by Suzanne Yalman of Coach University and Hilal Urlu of MEF University. Uh, it's become a tradition to publish the proceedings of these symposia, and we'll be working with the organizers of this symposium uh, to do the same. Through all of these things, Anamed provides what we hope to be an invigorating scholarly community, not only for its own fellows and Coach University affiliates, but also for the larger public. On behalf of Anamed, then, again, I welcome you to what I hope will be a stimulating symposium. To maintain this kind of an environment is no easy thing, of course, uh, and it happens only with the contributions of very many, from individuals to institutions. And so I would like to both thank and to congratulate uh, the organizers of this year's uh, symposium, former Anamed fellow Nilgun Oz and Coach University Archaeology and History of Art faculty and Anamed advisory board member, Christina Luke, for the inspired idea for this symposium and for putting together 
the program in collaborative effort with Isabel Anatole Gabriel, uh, who is the chief of the Europe and North America unit at UNESCO's World Heritage Center, and Burju Özdemir, uh, the associate program specialist of the same unit. We are grateful for this willingness to collaborate and hope it may lead to many further opportunities. You'll be hearing from all of these organizers and co-organizers shortly. I'd like to thank also um, all symposium participants and moderators for contributing to the program and resulting discussions, and to offer special thanks to Evrem Ulusan for participating on behalf of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of the Republic of Turkey, and prov for providing obviously essential perspectives from the state authority ultimately responsible for setting policies in the cultural heritage realm. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience today and I hope this afternoon and tomorrow for your interest, your participation and discussion and your patience with any delays, uh, any technical difficulties uh, or other glitches that uh, inev inevitably may occur. Moving from individuals to institutions, uh, this symposium and, and all of our symposia here at Anamed would, would not be possible were it not for the tireless work of the entire Anamed team, including Buket Joshkaner, Doigu Tarkan, Alijan Kutlai, Mukades Gul, and Murat Turk, and especially our assistant specialist for programs, Naz Uurlu, who worked continuously and very effectively, I might add, to bring this all together today. Finally, let me offer my profuse thanks to the VFB Coach Foundation and Coach University, the two institutions that make all things here at Anamed possible, along with Umer Coach, Vakuf President Erdal Yildirim, and University President Umran Inan. Now, to start off the real meat of the symposium with more specific and detailed and relevant comments on its important theme, and again with my sincere gratitude, let me invite to the lectern Neil Gun Oz, who will be speaking on behalf of the organizers, and welcome you all once again to what promises to be an important and, I hope, discussion-provoking two days. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, hoş geldiniz. Um, can I also welcome you to the 14th International Anamed Annual Symposium titled Heritage, World Heritage and the Future, Perspectives on Scale, Conservation and Dialogue. We are absolutely delighted to have so many of you here. This event builds on the panel which Christina and I organized last October, also hosted by Anamed, that focused on archaeology and conservation. Attended by a selection of excavation directors, representatives of local authorities and funding bodies, this interdisciplinary environment created a dialogue which we wish to pursue in greater detail. So today and tomorrow, we're bringing together a diverse set of speakers engaged in the practice of conservation of archaeological and natural heritage, where we embrace heritage conservation in its wider sense as a field that encompasses management planning, funding of conservation projects, public participation, and considerations of stakeholders as well as site conservation practices. We will explore current themes that impact cultural and natural heritage conservation and development in Turkey within a site-based focus. Case studies will highlight how concepts of archaeological and natural spaces interact with local perceptions and practices, and in turn how these perspectives complement visions expressed by international agenda, especially in the framework of the World Heritage Convention. Among the goals of this symposium is to explore in detail not only the challenges posed by regulatory constraints, but also how best to integrate conservation programs with academic research, as too often conservation is seen as outside the academe or tangential to excavation, survey and landscape. An important nexus in this conversation pivots on the prestige of world heritage and the delicate balance between policy and practice. Here, the process from preparation to inscription on the World Heritage List will be explored at multiple scales, from initial exploration of participation to the impact of inscription over the long term. 
We also hope to facilitate forging of new links and relationships between archaeological teams and conservation professionals, thereby continuing to the cons conservation of co contributing to the conservation of cultural and natural heritage in Turkey. On behalf of Christina and myself, I would like to thank Anamed and its staff for allowing us to have this symposium and to UNESCO for giving us the opportunity to explore conservation in the context of world heritage. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to share a pertinent observation from an eminent conservation expert, Frank Matero, who wrote over a decade ago that archaeological sites are made, not found. In this quote, Matero is alluding to a continuing process that perhaps begins even before the discovery of an archaeological site, in which it is shaped according to successive interventions that can be extended to include all aspects of conservation as it is understood today, driven by a multitude of cultural, social, economic and political factors. These are some of the issues we wish to explore over the next two days. We hope that you will be inspired by the symposium and come away with fresh ideas and new perspectives for the future. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Burcu Özdemir uh, from uh, UNESCO. Uh, Burcu uh, is a program specialist uh, and a dear friend, a colleague, uh, in the Europe and North America unit at the World Heritage Center UNESCO. Uh, she oversees the state of conservation of world heritage properties in Western and Northern Europe. Uh, she joined the center in 2014 and currently in charge of special projects and publications within the uh, Europe and North America uh, unit. Uh, by training, Burcu is an archaeologist and holds an MA in classical archaeology in Turkey. And during her studies and professional life, she participated in many excavations and uh, field work uh, in uh, Turkey. And since uh, in uh, 2004, between 2004 and uh, 2014, she worked at the Ministry of Culture and Tourism uh, in various departments, uh, including museum archaeological excavations and uh, others. And the title of her presentation is Overview of Conservation Challenges for Archaeological Properties in Europe Region. Teşekkür ederim Yonca Hanım. Ee, öncelikle şu, herkese merhaba. Öncelikle şunu söylemek istiyorum. Ee, UNESCO'da çalışmaya başladığımdan bu yana birçok farklı ülkede birçok farklı konuda sunum yaptım. Hep kendi kendime bir gün UNESCO şapkasıyla kendi ülkemde görece daha iyi bildiğim yüzlere sunum yaparsam daha rahat, daha rahat olacağımı düşünmüştüm. Hiç öyle değilmiş. Çok heyecanlıyım. <gülüyor> Ama çok da mutluyum sizlerin önünde olduğum için. Şimdi izin verirseniz sunumumu İngilizce hazırladığım için bundan sonrasında İngilizce devam edeceğim. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today and uh, I wish to express my gratitude to Anamet team, to the speakers as well as all participants for the upcoming discussion on the very fundamental issues on the World Heritage Mechanism. First, allow me to explain the structure of my presentation. Uh, I will talk about the relation between the World Heritage Convention and archaeological sites. Then we will consider the Europe region uh, in regard to the current and potential threats to archaeological sites, including some examples. Finally, I will consider the answer to the following question. What does an effective management system for archaeological World Heritage sites consist of. Everyone in this room may know about the adoption and the evolution of the World Heritage Convention. However, allow me to draw your attention uh, to the meaning of the convention for archaeological sites. The World Heritage Convention was adopted in 1972 in wake of the international safeguarding campaigns to protect major archaeological sites such as the temples of Abu Simbel in Egypt, or the Punic city of Carthage in Tunisia. Soon after the adoption of the 1972 convention, major archaeological sites all over the world were inscribed in the, on the World Heritage List and have become vehicles of the founding values of respect and responsibility attached to the heritage of humanity. Today, archaeological sites constitute approximately 30% of the World Heritage List, and this percentage can be easily increased if we also include the archaeological components of the other World Heritage categories. 
A wide range of values, historical and educational, social and economical, is ascribed to archaeological world heritage sites. Some of these values have been recognized since a long time and have, have given birth to specific national national policies for research and protection simultaneously supported by the emerging international standard framework. The challenges affecting the conservation mechanism uh, as, as well as the sustainability of the archaeological sites are varied. The origins of these challenges may be environmental but also social or political, meaning human-induced. The analysis on the state of conservation reports examined by the World Heritage Committee highlights 14 main key threats on the World Heritage archaeological sites globally. You can see them on the screen, uh, but please keep in mind that these, these are based on data from the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Center. Before addressing the threats that mostly arise in the Europe region, allow me to show you the boundaries of Europe for the World Heritage Mechanism. UNESCO has divided the world for, uh, into five regional uh, zones, which it calls regions Africa, Arab states, Asia and the Pacific, Europe, Europe and North America, and Latin America and the Caribbean. The UNESCO ge geographic zones uh, give greater emphasis on administrative rather than uh, geographic associations. In this context, you can see on the screen the countries uh, that are in the UNESCO World Heritage Region. Our analysis shows that in the Europe region, the most common challenges or threats are the lack of management systems, ground transport infrastructure, major visitor accommodation, tourism, financial resources, and of course, climate change related threats. These are, I repeat, uh, these are only the most common threats which were already subject uh, to, of the examination by the World Heritage Committee or the World Heritage Center. And this list can, of course, be extended by adding uh, other threats such as clandestine archaeological activities, pollution or natural disasters, etc. Now we will address four main challenges in light of some examples. These are uncontrolled development projects, visitor project pressure, conjectural reconstruction, and climate change. First one is uncontrolled development projects. One of the main challenges for the World Heritage Properties is certainly uncontrolled development. The challenge affects many of archaeological sites, the construction, or transportation projects resulting from the uncontrolled growth of cities or even villages without any prior heritage assessment pose a clear menace to the state of conservation of the site. In the case of uncontrolled development, the risks on the sites may be destruction of unknown archaeological remains, illegal trafficking, or skyline deterioration. You may follow the um, recent developments on Acropolis in Athens via the international or national press. This information is in relation to the construction and building permits of multi-story buildings located, located in the immediate surroundings of the World Heritage property. As a major urban archaeological site, the outstanding universal value of the property remains especially vulnerable, particularly in terms of the skyline or silhouette. Urban development has long been the major threat to archaeological sites. Archaeological sites in urban areas require more sensitive protection planning through the site management plan and its system, but also the special planning process in short and long-term actions. The skyline covers the visibility and the co-visibility of a site, monument or an ensemble. The visibility and the co-visibility are objective notions based on a quantitative approach to landscape and heritage. Developing the skyline policies is more important for urban archaeological sites. The focus is to identify the constituent heritage elements landscape and to characterize and qualify the different landscape units of the territory concerned by the project, particularly with regard to landscape and heritage elements and the outstanding universal value. In addition to the urban archaeological sites, the state of conservation of rural sites may also be threatened by several development projects. 
Stonehenge has been the subject of several World Heritage Committee decisions in recent years. The factors affecting the property are mainly infrastru infrastructure development pressure, such as the upgrading, the, of up upgrading of the trunk road project and proposals for sections of dual carriageway and tunnel portals within the property. The committee in its 44th session will re-examine the state of conservation of the property in light of its previous requests. <coughs> Visitor pressure. The impact of the tourism and culture on local development is undeniable. Moreover, the inscription on the World Heritage List brings an awareness of the sites and consequently an important tourism pressure which needs to be precisely monitored and controlled as archaeological sites contain fragile components. Visit visitor facilities such as signages, paths and guidance or a visitor center are very important to control the visitor pressure on the site and of course the sustainable tourism policies must be applied. The existing management plan of the Italian World Heritage Property, archaeological areas of Pompeii, Herculaneum and Torre Annunziata needs to be updated with a long-term perspective on conservation and visitor management. This is to avoid the potential negative impacts of the tourism on the state of conservation of the property as requested by the World Heritage Committee in 43rd session in 2019. Conjectural reconstruction is another threat. In the case of archaeological sites, authenticity is judged according to the ability of the archaeological remains to truthfully convey their meaning. In many cases, conjectural reconstruction might hinder this process and compromise authenticity. Similarly, while Reconstruction of incomplete buildings or structures can be justified in some circumstances. This can also impact on their ability to truthfully convey meaning. My example is not uh, spe specifically from an archaeological site, but I believe that it is important to share it with you to show the World Heritage Committee's approach on the issue. The World Heritage Committee determined at its 37th session in Phnom Penh 2013 uh, that due to the inappropriate rehabilitation, the authenticity of Bagrati Cathedral has been irreversibly compromised and it no longer contributes to the justification for the criterion for which the property was inscribed. Therefore, since the committee decision in 2017, the Bagrati Cathedral is no longer a component of the World Heritage property. This example proves once more the importance that the outstanding universal value of the site is clear to all stakeholders involved in its protection or rehabilitation. And finally, climate change. Of course, climate change affects the state of conservation of several archaeological sites. However, the archaeological sites in the Arctic region are being lost to climate change faster than sites as well. As well. The cold and wet climate of the Arctic has in the past contribute, contributed to the extraordinary preservation of archaeological sites and materials. With climate change, these sites with their range, wide range of cultural and environmental archives are now unfortunately increasingly affected by climate-related variables. You can see on the screen UNESCO's publication on climate change and world heritage. The management system is the, is the response in the framework of the World Heritage Convention to the mentioned threats. When I shared the list of the threats, you saw at the top of the li list lack of management plan and system. Actually, this omission greatly contributes to the rest of the threats. The question is, what does an effective management system for archaeological world heritage sites consist of? Whilst threats to the survival of such heritage may come from a vast array of sources, they often arise from the fast-paced development of modern societies. 
Very often, conservation efforts are focused on tackling material decay as this is the most visible of the threats. However, the only way to minimize the effects of the many factors of decay is a management system that contains an applicable management plan and process based on a clear statement of outstanding universal value, public participation, conservation, monitoring, presentation and interpretation, and sustainable tourism and action plans. Additionally, adding the site as a fundamental component to existing territorial planning process may, may in, many, in many cases prevent the otherwise likely damage to the archaeological heritage. The management system must be based on outstanding universal value, community involvement, and also risk preparedness. The outstanding universal value. Uh, as mentioned by Erin earlier, uh, she, she talked about the inscription process and I will talk about after, after the inscription. The outstanding universal value, its attributes, integrity, authenticity are notions well known in the perspective of our heritage mechanism. These notions must, must be correctly determined and shared with all stakeholders. The management objectives and actions must be identified in the light of the attributes, attributes that convey the outstanding universal value. The outstanding universal value should not be only an initial concern taken into account only when a property is inscribed on the World Heritage List. One its existence has been demonstrated by the experts and approved by the World Heritage Committee the outstanding universal value remains to be maintained or even improved. Thus, in this respect of the values and fundamental characteristics ju that justify its inscription, the description of the outstanding universal value of a property can be improved, enriched in the understanding of its dimensions and the priorities of conservation. The statement of the outstanding universal value is sometimes insufficient to clearly express its special and multidimensional expression. The knowledge, expression and objectives of preservation can be improved and clarified for all audiences. Moreover, since the convention is based on a conception of the valuable heritage, the management plans and their conservation approaches must be reactive in so far as these heritage values, engines of decision-making, are not static. We increasingly recognize the responsibility of local communities. Their participation in the management system is extremely important in order to build a common understanding to protect and promote the heritage. To achieve this objective, the identification of stakeholders is extremely important is essential. Defin definitions of stakeholder are of course varied. However, all groups with an interest in a particular site must from the outset be included in the planning process to create a greater sense of ownership and social cultural affiliation and a stronger local identity. The sustainable conservation and man management of archaeological sites can be enhanced through site management plans that are based on a clear understanding of the site's values and with the broad participation of its stakeholders and local community. And I don't want to finish my presentation without emphasizing um, that disasters, such as the recent fires in the, in, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the National Museum of Brazil, or in Okinawa in Japan, showed us how fragile our uh, heritage and the importance of having a consolidated disaster risk management plan and the management plan. The methodology of the management planning process must be coherent, but also sufficiently flexible and uh, suited to local conditions. Finally, it is also very important to underline that the management system requires a legal framework as the system can only be effective if the management plan of the site is recognized as an official and legal document. Thank you. The next uh, speaker of this session, uh, Ms. Uh, Isabel Anatole uh, Gabriel, 
uh, from World Heritage uh, Center of UNESCO. Uh, let me also introduce her uh, to you. Um, Dr. Uh, Gabriel is the chief of uh, Europe and North America unit at the World Heritage Center since uh, January 2016. Um, by training, uh, she, is, um, she holds a PhD in international heritage, and she also has three master's uh, uh, degrees in museum studies, archaeology, and history, uh, respectively received from Ecole de Louvre, uh, Sorbonne University, and uh, EH, uh, ESS. Um, uh, she is uh, a curator by training, and uh, she was seconded to UNESCO by the uh, uh, Direction de Musée de France um, in uh, 1988. Then she joined uh, UNESCO uh, later on, and she served uh, as the program specialist in the culture sector uh, earlier. So the presentation, the title of her uh, presentation is UNESCO in Context, Overview of Archaeology in Europe and the Role of uh, Turkey. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning, a very good morning to everyone. I must say I'm always very happy to come back to Istanbul and to Turkey. Turkey has always been a very important, emblematic uh, country uh, in view of my studies. I mean, my CV might uh, give you the impression that I am as old as the archaeological sites we are dealing with today. I hope it's not yet <laughs> reached this stage. However, I just want to say first um, thank you to um, the host and the uh, director of uh, Anamed for hosting this meeting. Thank you for the representative of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of Turkey for joining us. Thank you for my colleague and chair of the World Heritage uh, Chair in uh, Yonca. But most of all, thank you to all of you, archaeologists, scholars, students, and the public, uh, citizens, who are committed and interested in keeping archaeology and heritage art large alive for the future generation. I have not always not worked at the World Heritage Center, as uh, Yoncha mentioned. I joined the center quite recently, if I may say. But I, I would like to share with you, this is the American way of doing it, I would like to share with you a small story before I start my presentation. The very first meeting I joined when I uh, joined the World Heritage Center, the very first meeting I attended with was, I'm sure everyone will remind this meeting, was the meeting on the submission of the Ephesus nomination file to the World Heritage Committee. There was a number of very high scholars coming from Turkey to this meeting, and there was my colleague, but there were also my colleagues from the center. And we started the discussion on the different criteria that will be good for uh, an approval by the committee. And there was already some two uh, out of the six criteria which were ticked by ECOMOS uh, during the evaluation, but there were also another criteria, the last one, criteria six on associated values, which is a very tricky and very um, tentative criteria that actually, I mean, we are discussing at the World Heritage Center with the advisory bodies and experts. And I will always remind the dialogue that took place at that time. Turkey, the expert and scholar, have explained that they wish to submit this file because criteria C was uh, important for the spiritual and religious use of the site, not to mention the Council of Ephesus, which is, in terms of history and religious history, quite important in uh, the Western world. And the answer of colleagues, I would not quote, uh, will not quote them, of course, the answer of the colleague was, you are already thinking the boxes 
of phonomination. You don't need another criteria to get your no, no file inscribed. So no need to explain further. I say this story because I think it is exemplary of what we are trying to do today, which is to consider how archaeological research, the knowledge, the production of knowledge on heritage and sites, is, can be an asset or can be contradictory to an enormous normative framework, which is the World Heritage Convention. So is it knowledge versus norms? Is it archaeological research versus dogmatic approach? This should not be the case. And I like very much what my colleague Evrim just explained to you. This must be a discussion. This must be a dialogue. And there is no pyramid of who says that and what is at the end decide. It must be a dialogue. It must be a discussion. So again, I thank Anna Med for allowing this discussion and uh, allowing also representatives of the World Heritage Center to be exposed to your research, to be exposed to your issues, to be exposed to your problems, and to listen to you. And this being said, I have <laughs> already wasted five minutes of my time, but I will be on time. I start my presentation. Archaeological sites are of value for different reasons to different groups of individuals, including scientists, local population, visitors, and national authorities. For decision makers to be able to protect these values, they must first be recognized. The intrinsic importance of finite nature of archaeological resources have been recognized in various international charters, such as the recommendation of the Athens Conference in 1931, International Charter, Charter for the Conservation and Restoration of Monuments and Sites, the Venice Charter, and of course, the 1972 Convention. In recent years, various forces have increased the threat to, those, to these sites. Among others, rapidly increasing urbanization, environmental degradation, natural disaster, violent conflicts, and in many countries, a lack of resources for the maintenance. The extraordinary growth of mass tourism in the last few years has brought about a change in the way archaeological sites are used. Since archaeological sites are non-renewable resources, their management and maintenance are essential. Therefore, the main purpose of UNESCO, particularly the World Heritage Center, is to promote the protection of the archaeological heritage through coordinated management of its appropriate uses. Research, education, <coughs> and tourism. Again, I would like to underline that without lazing with research on academic, we cannot make the World Heritage Con Convention a sustainable instrument for archaeological sites. You are crucial people for the convention. A systematic planning process must be established that takes into consideration many factors relating to the status of the site, the resources available, the local and national laws, and the values perceived by the various interested groups. European archaeological sites, and especially the Mediterranean classical antiquity, was instrumental in shaping the notion of world heritage and embedding its values. Indeed, its specific potential as a resource for knowledge and experience to address global changes is often mis underestimated. The archaeological remains of past civilization in Europe, especially in the Mediterranean region, have started receiving visits in the early 19th century. Later, scientists and academics studied the site and their history, which subsequent, subsequently shaped our knowledge and understanding of our past. And thank you so much, Doctor, for your very uh, um, 
comprehensive and enlightening presentation of what is had changed in the context of archaeological knowledge and theory today. These archaeological areas started attracting an, interesting, an increasing interest of the public. Today, archaeological sites, especially World Heritage archaeological sites in the Europe region, are visited by millions of visitors every year. The UNESCO World Heritage List is a universal list belonging to all humanity, and it is accepted that the properties on the list should be accessible for visitors from all around the world. Yet, the responsibility for the protection of sites falls on the state parties which, in which they are located. And I understand your message, Avery. For this reason, in all World Heritage archaeological, archaeological sites, but especially in the Europe region, the following steps, steps are particularly important. Understanding, planning, managing, reconstruction, and presentation of the sites. What is the situation in Turkey? Turkey is at the crossroads between Europe and Asia, with a diverse heritage of civilizations that have had a cultural and historical influence worldwide. It has been the cradle of major cultures and civilization, including the Anatolian civilization that have spread all over Arabic and European regions. Turkey is home to 18 world heritage sites, and many of them are archaeological sites. Relying on the long-standing research work by its academic institutions, I w as well as its experience as a former member of the World Heritage Committee between 1983 and 1989, and lately 2012-2017, Turkey has shed new light. Uh, sorry, uh, Turkey has shed new light on the importance of managing archaeological heritage in the Europe region. In recent years. Turkey has nominated on the World Heritage List major testimonies of the archaeological past of ancient cultures and civilization present on its territories. Chattel Huyuk, Pergamon, Ephesus, Ani, Aphrodisias, Gebelgitepe. And we are very happy that we have just heard that many others will come. In addition, Turkey is currently initiating major construction or renovation projects of archaeological museums such as the Troy Museum and the Zögma and Haite Mosaic Museums in Istanbul, the largest mosaic museums in the world, and the Istanbul Archaeology Museum's renovation, of course. Research activities conducted on these sites by public and private academic institu institutions have been instrumental to the identification and understanding of the outstanding universal values of these properties. I assume you have had a understanding of what is the OUV, our key word in the World Heritage Convention and Center to, uh, today. And of course, we should underline that with the support from the EU, Turkey has established the first National Archaeology Institute in the southeastern south, south province of Gaziantep. The, the European Union Turkey Anatolian Archaeology and Cultural Heritage Institute project was kicked off on February 2019 and will take 30 months to finish. I wish to express and to strongly underline that Turkey is best positioned to build on the experience gained in the governance of archaeological world heritage properties to harness our collective past as a major resource for a sustainable future. As a global phenomenon, the properties are not geographically exclusive and require an exclusive and comprehensive approach in terms of their study and conservation. The nature of the properties necessitates a strong cooperation between the fields of both science and culture to inform a deeper understanding of the, our cultural origins. Archaeologists, archaeologists face a difficult challenge in trying to create balance between continuity and change in the modern world. Legislation and regulations can only do so much to protect the monuments. The rest 
relies on the work of the public. Without public awareness of the value of heritage and archaeology and good communication among heritage professionals, archaeologists cannot justify the cost associated with maintenance and protection. I'm sure you all know the work that has been conducted by the Getty Conservation Institute 20 years ago on this connection between values and heritage. I would like to add here that when we initially had the idea to establish this cooperation with Turkey on the archaeological heritage, our aim was to highlight the managerial experience on archaeological heritage sites concerning the three core activities of the management process, research, conservation, and presentation. Our intention is now moving beyond this. We wish to build on and expand the cooperation with Turkey's prestigious institutions in the field of archaeology to establish an international network of archaeological world heritage experts dedicated to sharing experiences and good practices for world heritage management. Effective archaeological heritage management cannot rely on legislation and on a top-down approach. Instead, it must take into account the current social issues and fully include the whole society in its common objective of protecting something that belongs to all. Indeed, it is only through promoting a deeper understanding of cultural heritage matters that the sustainability and protection of archaeological areas can be ensured. This requires a good professional network. In light of the 1972 convention, the World Heritage Mechanism has the means to create an interdisciplinary platform to share the, practice, the practices on the protection, conservation, management, and presentation experience through a thematic program within the World Heritage Center. Such a network would give you an opportunity to make your voices and experience reach a wider audience. The aim is to work with heritage professionals, academics, site managers, local authorities, decision makers, NGOs, etc., and chairs, of course, who can have a small or big impact on the archaeological heritage management. The development of such a program will be directed toward defining and establishing a solid strategy of cooperation and implementation to ensure the future recognition, conservation, and study of these early vulnerable sites in relation to world heritage. Thank you. Uh, now, the session is uh, titled um, Situating uh, World Heritage, and we'll be uh, listening to four speakers, starting with Zabine Lachstetter, and uh, to quickly introduce uh, her, uh, she's the director of the Austrian Archaeological Institute and the director of uh, the Ephesus Archaeological Project, uh, and um, she's, uh, she was trained as an archaeologist in every field, like from classical archaeology to uh, prehistory, protohistoric, and ancient history, and uh, she is involved in economic and landscape archaeology and uh, documentation and preservation of arche uh, archaeological cultural heritage. Uh, so today she'll be talking about the uh, Ephesus and the process before and after uh, of getting uh, into the list of the UNESCO cultural heritage list. Thank you so much. So I think I have to find my, it's okay. So thank you very much for inviting me um, to this uh, wonderful um, event. Um, I want to talk, uh, of course I talk about Ephesus uh, today. Uh, and um, when Ephesus was selected as a World Cultural Heritage Site in June 2015, the stakeholders were able to look back over a years long and very productive collaboration. And in this kind, I want to especially thank uh, Ebrim for our collaboration, but also I think an, uh, a 
couple of other people are here, so and looking at everyone's presentation about the smooth inscription process of Ephesus, I suppose we did a good job. <laughs> Uh, the application process signified for us an intensive engagement with Ephesus from a variety of perspectives. Let us first summarize the status quo as it pertained in 2015. Ephesus was recorded in the list of World Heritage Sites as a serial property consisting of the individual components of Chukurichi Hoik, it's uh, here. Uh, Ephesus, of course you know it, Aya Suluk with the Artemision, and uh, Meriemana. 664 hectares of core zone are confronted with 1,226 hectares of buffer zone. Three criteria were considered worthy as World Cultural Heritage. The World Heritage Committee viewed criterion three as fulfilled, that is, uh, a unique or at least exceptional testimony of a cultural tradition or to a civilization which has disappeared and an exceptional testimony to the cultural traditions of the Hellenistic, Roman, Imperial and early Christian period. The cultural traditions of the Roman imperial period are reflected in an outstanding representative buildings of the city center, including the Library of Celsus, Hadrian's Temple, the Serapeion, and Terrace House II, with its wall paintings, mosaics, and marble panelings showing the style of living of the upper levels of society at that time. Criterion 4 was also considered to be validated an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural or technological ensemble or landscape which illustrates significant stages in human history. Ephesus as a whole is an outstanding example of a settlement landscape determined by uh, environmental factors over time. The ancient city stands out as a Roman harbor city with sea channel and harbor basin along the Kaistros River. Earlier and subsequent harbors demonstrate the changing river landscape from the classical Greek to medieval periods. Criterion six, and now I'm coming to the discussion in Paris, uh, as I was a member of the Turkish team in those days. Criterion six, namely the significance of Ephesus directly uh, associated with events or living traditions, with ideas or with beliefs, with artistic and literary works of outstanding universal significance, experienced a negative evaluation on the part of ECOMOS but was later then accepted by the UNESCO. The first negative recommendation was greatly surprising for us, as Ephesus does indeed offer numerous historical accounts and archaeological remains of significant religious traditions, starting with the cult of Artemis and Kybele to Christianity and finally Islam, all visible and traceable in Ephesus. Um, the extensive remains of the Basilica of St. John on Aya Suluk Hill. I can't see it here, so somehow there's a problem. Can we quickly? Okay. You haven't seen any images. <laughs> so I have to go back. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mm. I was just looking at the screen. <laughs> so, yeah. so, of course, this was Paris in 2015, and Evrim and me, part of the Turkish uh, delegation there. Uh, this is the core zone uh, with uh, Chukurichi Hoik here. Ephesus, uh, Ayasuluk, and uh, Meriemana. So the next, the beautiful images of Chukurichihuik, the Artemision, and Ephesus. And then the outstanding value of architecture in the city center of Ephesus, uh, or you all know the, monument, the monuments, and that's uh, uh, the surrounding of Ephesus, the Hellenistic and Roman city in the front, and Selchuk with the Artemision and backside. And this 
uh, the, uh, the channel, the harbor basin and uh, the channel also core zone. I'm really proud of this. Uh, and uh, here again, now I'm coming to the religious uh, importance of Ephesus with the Artemision here. And this was the next slide with the other monument. So the, the sanctuary of Kubele Meta and uh, the, um, the churches. This is uh, on the left side is Church of St. Mary and on the right side, uh, Church of St. Paul. And again, uh, also with Isabel Mosque and uh, the Seven Sleepers Cemetery. And now you sh we should be in Meriamana. Um, or I have to go back. So the extensive remains of the Basilica of St. John on Aya Sulukil and those of the Church of Mary in Ephesus are testament to the city's importance to Christianity. Two important councils of the early church were held in Ephesus, at Ephesus in 431 and 449, initiating the veneration of Mary in Christianity. Ephesus was also a leading political and intellectual center with great influence on philosophy and medicine uh, in the pagan, Christian, and Muslim era. It was nevertheless very uh, quickly clear uh, that uh, the rejection by, by the professional advisory board did not refer to the religious, historical, and spiritual importance of Ephesus in general, but to the fourth component of the serial property, namely Meriemana. According to legend here, in the hills around Ephesus, Mary, the mother of God, died, and after its wondrous discovery in the late 19th century, her house was venerated and visited by hundreds of thousands of pilgrims. Icomus wanted to see Meriamana strike him from the list. Since neither integrity nor authenticity were provable, but after a solid re-evaluation of the existing data and sources, the committee couldn't be convinced. In a certain way, Ephesus represented a special case since we are dealing with an archaeological site that at the time of the cultural heritage application was already well known throughout the world. In addition, it represented a goal for mass tourism for decades. It therefore did not surprise me that the general reaction to the decision regarding world cultural heritage was a question, namely, Hasn't Ephesus already been a world cultural heritage site for ages? I have already commented extensively on other, in other places on the history of research of the site and the phenomenon of mass tourism. And therefore, here, I would like to draw your attention to another aspect, namely the dialectic of vision and reality of a world cultural heritage site, which is determined by a variety of factors. Fundamentally, three pillars are relevant in this regard, archaeology, conservation, and tourism. Let's begin with the vision and reality in the area of archaeology. If we trace the history of excavation at Ephesus back over 125 years, we see that at the beginning the ambitious goal was a holistic landscape archaeological investigation of the settlement area. In the process, neither chronological nor cultural limitations should pay, play a role. The physiographic preconditions revealed themselves to be aggravating, specifically the swarm formation of the ancient settlement area, which presented methodological and technical problems for the 19th century excavators. In hindsight, if we compare the archaeological vision of the 19th century with the reality, a certain disillusionment occurs. Precisely in the excavation intensive decades after the Second World War, the concentration was strongly on the Roman city center, ultimately on the exposure of individual monuments that were without doubt impressive. It has only been in recent decades, thanks to technical developments as well as a general change in the perspective of archaeology, that the investigation of the landscape has again taken center stage. 
For Ephesus, this means in concrete terms that the populated urban area and its surroundings are studied geophysically and the lower Kaistros Valley is investigated extensively by means of paleogeographic drilling in order to define the settlement area and to understand the process of coastal displacement. The results uh, of these studies uh, also float directly into the definition of core and buffer zones for the UNESCO submission. By way of example, we can point to the harbour landscape of Ephesus, which on the basis of these studies could be integrated into the cultural heritage area. It's partly not visible nowadays whereby the entire canal from its outlet in the Mediterranean up to the Roman harbour basin um, over a length of six kilometers has become a protected area. If, however, we observe the landscape of Ephesus today, we must also confront two realities. The floodplain is extensively agriculturally utilized, in particular for the cultivation of trees and plantations. The ownership structure includes many individual private plots, which in addition are frequently leased. Accordingly, the labor conditions as well as the protection of the archaeological monuments also prove to be difficult. The spectrum extends from absolutely open willingness to cooperate up to prohibition to enter, as is the case at the Odeon in the Artemisian, which stands in the middle of a fruit plantation. And here we had uh, the working permit to study this uh, monument, but we were not allowed to pass uh, the plantation, so <laughs> a crane would have been the only solution for working there. Yeah. Um, the prehistoric tell of Chukurichihoik represents a particularly special case. It is divided amongst numerous different private owners, and therefore research here had to be limited to a small area in the north. The second challenge is represented by the zoning plan of Selchuk, a growing small city. Precisely in the historic area of the city, and here I'm referring to Atatürk Mahalasi, a gentle expansion is absolutely necessary. The historical development of the 19th century included neither foundations nor basements, whereas in contrast the new buildings on the same spaces encroach into the archaeological substance and therefore must also be supervised scientifically. Incidentally, this also affects the excavation house, shown here, which is situated in this zone. In my opinion, the example of Ephesus shows very clearly how valuable archaeological fundamental research is for the management of world cultural heritage sites. For precisely, the definition of buffer zones ex is extremely dependent on the level of awareness of ancient settlement zones. These are in no ways always visible, but lie buried as in the case of Ephesus, under layers of debris and flood deposits that are meters deep. A consequential and extensive survey of the cultural landscape is therefore, in my opinion, an urgent necessity of every archaeological cultural heritage site. In contrast, my, in my opinion, with excavation activities, we are obliged to limit ourselves to that which is most crucial and to include in our calculations the long-term preservation as well as the chronological, personal related and financial issues even before excavation is initiated. It is clear that archaeological excavation projects are oriented towards scientific question and that these also determine the choice of methods. This statement stands in contrast to, the, um, to that very perception of archaeology that determines the publicity and also the politics and whose expectation include a complete uncovering of large areas. It is therefore very important to emphasize over and over again, perhaps not in this or, uh, audience, but in public, that the complete uncovering is not at all the goal of archaeological research. The goal is far rather the acquisition of information from a precisely spatially defined area based on targeted questions.
Therefore, the added value of excavation lies less in an expansion of the cubic meters excavated, but instead far rather in the expansion of knowledge. The great challenge lies, however, in the conversion of this academic knowledge into generally comprehensible information. For this knowledge transfer, a translation, a narrative, is necessary. Currently, this work is carried out by archaeologists, who nevertheless do not have the necessary training for it. For it. Detective and museum pedagogical support would be urgently required in order to better meet the diverse expectations of the target audience. Perhaps I will return to this point later. Let us now turn uh, to uh, the uh, vision of um, and reality in restoration. The exceptional state of preservation of individual monuments in Ephesus provided the impetus already at the beginning of the excavation activities to carry out the first architectural models. Then, after the Second World War, an extensive program of anastylosis was embarked upon in the context of which a number of monuments were re-erected. The goal of this was to create ensembles of plazas in defined city quarters and to connect these by means of streets. Walking along, along the ancient street surfaces bordered by columns, as well as visually taking in buildings which were standing upright, was thought to provide an impression of the original image of the city. The high number of visitors may be taken as evidence of the success of this concept. Furthermore, individual monuments were made fit for use in order to be able to hold events, primary concerts there. The appearance of Ephesus today is characterized by these two strands, which ultimately also determine the visitor's guided path. Ephesus, and this too I have also expressed in details uh, uh, elsewhere, is an impressive example of the development and practical implementation of restoration approaches over a time period of approximately 100 years. The lessons that can be learned from Ephesus are nevertheless generally valid. The vision of a crafted ensemble is confronted with great challenges in its preservation. This affects not only ancient but also modern materials and also their ability to withstand weather conditions, earthquakes and much more. Only a consequent monitoring and maintaining guarantee a sustainable securing of the inventory. Stable working conditions are nevertheless the base, basic prerequisites. Ultimately, precisely in highly frequented touristic sites, a change of thinking is early urgently needed. Conservation measures have to be oriented towards the pattern of damage of the object and not towards considerations regarding its presentation. For Ephesus, this means, moreover, that there is much um, that needs to be uh, remedied uh, ret uh, retroactively. Whereas great attention was paid to the central plaza and boulevards, large expanses of the excavated city have been left to themselves. I view this as one of the greatest challenges for cultural heritage sites to safeguard the inventory in its entirety, to undertake no value judgment, be it touristic or archaeological, and to develop a duty of care towards the ruins. Naturally, this is a Herculanean task at Ephesus and can only be successful as a long-term project. Please allow me to illustrate this by a small, perhaps, uh, a small example, yet one is, in my opinion, extremely valuable. Over recent years, we have cleaned all of the sections impacted by erosion and, when necessary, unearthed them, consolidated them and faced them with dry stone walls.
We use the rubble stones that were present on site, a fact which has considerably contributed to a homogenization of the appearance of the ruins. These measures have proven to be protective and effective, and in addition, inexpensive. We would gladly have to um, have also completed the final section, the Upper Curry Street, during the 2019 season, but unfortunately, we ran out of time. Okay. Um, a, a point of intersection between archaeological research, restoration, and presentation of ruins was created in Terrace House 2, where research, uh, restoration, and touristic visitation all take place at the same time. This on-site laboratory is also very popular with the visitors due, not least to the fact that work here can be experienced up to close. This example reveals, in my view, very clearly that it makes perfect sense not to show to the consumers of ancient sites, that is, primarily non-specialist visitors, a complete picture and not a scenic display of ruins, but ra far rather to illustrate the processes involved. In this manner, we should not shrink from presenting the ruins as incomplete or leaving question unanswered. Please allow me to formulate this idea in the words of a famous Austrian poet, Ingebert Bachmann. I'm quoting, the truth is reasonable for men. With this is associated the demand of participation, a participation that seems to be less pronounced precisely at world cultural heritage sites that are, uh, that are touted as must-see must sites and are also visited. This nonetheless leads to my third and last point, vision and reality in tourism. Sites of mass tourism, such as Ephesus, are exposed to burdens that naturally have an immediate effect on archaeological research and restoration. But tourist, tourism itself also finds it in a dramatic transition. New visitor groups demand a completely different concept of presentation and mediation. Why is it, do you think, that Chinese tourists have their photographs taken in masses next to these two reliefs? These are the trademarks, Hermes and Nike, leading to the fact that entire groups, even at the entrance to the ruins, ask where these reliefs are set up so that they can take an eagerly anticipated photo. This vis the vision of a holistic narrative that should be experienced in the course of a visit of Ephesus is overtaken by the reality sketched here. But regardless of whether it's a North American member of the educated class, a European climate activist, or a Chinese name brand junkie, each person has its, his or her own perspective on the site visited, and each person takes his or her impressions home with them. And Ephesus itself is a brand. <laughs> It is therefore not our duty to make the archaeological sites visitor fit, but rather to situate the fundamental preservation at center stage. Each action should not be carried out for somebody, but on behalf of the site itself. In order to achieve this, one aspect seems uh, to me, uh, me to be unavoidable, namely awareness raising of the local communities in order to obtain a deep-rooted identification with the ancient sites. Only when the bottom-up principle takes effect are sites such as Ephesus sustainably protected. A global glance at world cultural heritage sites clearly reveals the dangers. As an archaeologist traveling around the world with open eyes, I quite often have to wonder at the stage in which world heritage sites are encountered. I'm not talking about Africa, I'm talking about Italy, for instance, in Pompeii. Or uh, the cultural related world community looks on powerlessly at the destruction of cultural heritage causes by religious fanatism or war. We are worried, we are affected, we are shocked. These reactions, however, do not make barbarians shrink from the destruction of monuments. But on the other hand, the same world community is not willing to perceive cultural property as something global. 
and to take up the responsibility and the associated consequences. National, national interests are placed above those of a universal cultural concept. The costs for the maintenance of cultural monuments are shunned and the monuments left to their own devices. The public hears perhaps about Palmyra or Pompeii, but the public does not hear a lot about Abu Mina, for instance, or the, um, the um, a harbor in Carthage about the pyramids in uh, Chichen uh, Itza and how um, and, and their con uh, condition. What sense does all of this make if we invest all our efforts in attaining a status, yet we do not appreciate the accompanying responsibility, or we cannot appreciate it? What I call for is a global civil society, societal sense of responsibility for cultural heritage with or without any status. And I would like to end my presentation with a very, very Austrian leisure pleasure picture during our winter seasons in Ephesus. Thank you very much. So, we will continue with Thomas uh, Kafer, uh, who works with Schenk Architects, and uh, he he has worked as a anastylosis architect uh, at the, uh, in, in uh, for this years for many years, and we're looking uh, we're um, excited about hearing about your uh, restoration work uh, at the site. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I'm. Uh, uh, my name is Thomas Kafer, and I've been working at the Aphrodisias uh, site as an anastylosis architect uh, for more than 30 years. And I had the pleasure even to work together with Kenan Arim for two years before he passed away. Aphrodisias is a city in uh, the Meander Valley on a tributary of the Meander River. It flourished in a grandly built urban entirety from the 1st to the 6th century AD. In this talk, I would like to go uh, with you through the site, choosing several points of interest and to show you what happened to these places, what might have been done correctly in former times, or what we tend now to consider have been done incorrectly, and what could have been and what we adjusted so far in modern times. I would like to demonstrate the continuity in change in our more recent anastylosis projects and how different and important dialogue and communication work together on ongoing projects. As an introduction here, in Aphrodisias, the history of excavation, I would divide in three uh, big chapters. We are talking about 100 years. The first one is 1904 till 1905. The second big period, 61 to 1990, the time of Kenan Arim. And the period three is 1991 till today, till the present, where we are there. But apart from these three major periods, I would like also to call to your attention the Society of Dilettanti from the 18th century, who traveled to Aphrodisias and did some first drawings of the site or etchings. Today, we would consider them as impronistic uh, renderings. Back to the periods. From 1904 till 1905, first excavations were undertaken by a French railway engineer named Paul Godin, who was focused on digging the Hadrianic bath. Period two, 1961 till 1990, is the period after World War II, it was our late director, Kenan T. Arim from New York University, who started to excavate there in 1961. 
His time lasted until 1990, so approximately 30 years of large-scale excavation, repairs, small re-erections, and finally the first genuine anastylosis in Aphrodisias, the tetrapylon. Period 3, 1991, we are today in period 3, which I have referred as 91 to the present. Our directors are Bert Smith from Oxford University, Catherine Welch from New York University and other personnel. Aphrodisias was listed as a World Heritage Site in 2017 with a one-year delay as we heard before. Now we go back to period one. This is a very rare picture I found when Paul Godin came 1904 to Aphrodisias. His sheer interest was in finding sculpture. He and his team concentrated on the Hadrianic Baths. Wonderful sculpture was found indeed, among which was the fisherman's torso. This masterpiece then found its way to the Bergemann Museum in Berlin, where it still is on display. This, of course, happened in a time when it was legal to export uh, such finds. And here, precisely, I want to switch to the time of Kenanarium, 1989. We are talking now 85 years later. It was Kenan who immediately and ingeniously recognized the head of the fisherman adjoining to the torso in Berlin. He found his head in a pool close to the Hadrianic Bath. Uh, we see, 85 years later, Canonarium being aware what was taken from Aphrodisias 85 years ago, immediately went and contacted the Bergemann Museum, which was not easy at this time because uh, the German Democratic Republic was about to dissolve in 89. Finally, a cast of the body was sent to Aphrodisias and we, meanwhile, can see this statue in the Aphrodisias Museum. We have a cast of the body and at the moment a cast of the head. The original head is in the museum depots and more pieces had been found in the last years and we will uh, have this uh, statue hopefully very soon on display. Uh, as I said before, the years 61 till 89 consisted mostly of excavation and only when necessary it involved re-erection, which was then seemed to be easy and quick to do. And I would like to show you now some key examples of such repairs and re-erections in the time period too. By referring to a endangered column in the Temple of Aphrodite. If we look at the Temple of Aphrodite today, it uh, seems not to look so much different than it looked 350 years ago at the time when the Society of Dilettanti visited Aphrodisias. Some of the standing columns had suffered over the centuries and needed urgent care in order to prevent them from collapsing. Care was indeed taken by Kenan Arim's team in the 70s and the way it was done was the only possible and available method in this time. There was no restorator no conservator at the site among the team. Urgent repairs, re-erections, were done by the local locksmith. A gifted man, but nevertheless a locksmith. So, a particular column, I have to go this way. A particular column seen here in the temple seemed to be on the verge of collapsing any moment. A colony severely shifted by many earthquakes, but has never fallen down. 
Canon Arim in the 60s must have been very concerned at this site. So what did he do? He asked the locksmith. He tried to repair the column by attaching a concrete patch. underneath the most dangerously shifted part of the column. So far, so good, but the visual appearance was really unsupportable. Our approach in 2004 was at least to work, what we wanted is, we wanted to work on the surface or to make it look more presentable. But before going to work there, we asked a static engineer about his opinion. He was in, consulted and his answer was rather shocking. He said that this column is only standing up by some miracle. <laughs> At this juncture, I shall admit that we today, we know solutions for solving problems like this. We would dismantle the whole column, repair each piece and put it up again. Although we have the specialists, we have the material. Although, we did not and we do not have, in this special a case, the nearby access to the column for heavy equipment and a crane, what we would need. Too much of the surrounding original area of the temple would have to be dismantled or temporarily relocated just to get in with a crane. So the interim solution was, I don't know if you see it, to dowel this column in the status quo, here and here, with two dowels. The three column drums had been pinned together, so they are now seated upon each other. This was done most carefully with two stainless steel dowels, and these dowels can easily be removed one day, when we will be able to take the column down, maybe with a bigger crane, or someone else after us. Now what's about the treatment of this concrete patch here? Uh, we took it down. Uh, I'm very glad to say that sometimes, but very rarely, luck is also involved. We actually found the missing part of the column drum, not too far away. But bringing it up, where it belonged and fixing it there, all by manpower was our really last task on this precarious column. This is how it looks now. The column itself will stay on our to-do list for the future, I promise. Uh, beside this emergency repairs and conservation, uh, in Kennan's time also restoration took place in the theater. The theater was dug out by Canon Arim in the early 70s. All, one, all I can see, or one can see today, was covered then by the village. This is a very uh, bad picture from then, from the 1971, I think. Uh, the fallen columns and architraves were all lying around. And it seemed to be an easy task to re-erect them. However, due to a lack of architect, restorer or conserver, the work was done by the same workers who excavated the theater under supervision of, you know, the local locksmith. <laughs> the result was at first sight astonishing. The theater had a stage building the first story of the building, the Doric one. But unfortunately, it had been put up wrongly. Uh, for all columns in this monument had been a setup point in the pavement in antiquity as mason marks, which showed precisely where the column should go, the front. How should the poor locksmiths know. Again, today we do not blame anyone for making a mistake like this, especially when these people were no specialists. The incorrect re-erection was not the only mistake, unfortunately. If you look at this, very important is the 
situation between the capital and the architrave. The architrave lowest fascia was flushing with the abacus of the capital. The situation had lasted about 40 years, and I would like to remember 85 years for the fisherman's head, 40 years till we are, were able to react on something here. When the situation began to become dangerous, parts of the capital started to crack, being stressed. The architrave's weight was never meant to bear. In 2011 and 12, the whole thing was dismantled by us and we set it up the right way. Of course, uh, we had uh, in a dialogue in our team as soon as the problem was known and was the problem was made a priority. The undertaking looks much easier than it actually was. All columns had to be dulled, were dulled and glued into the floor with epoxy resin in the 70s. So in order to damage anything, the columns had to be taken out with their stylobates and dissolved in our uh, workshop and then would be placed in can, again in place. In this special case, the question of urgency of the project in comparison to other necessities of the site or in relation to a time schedule we have was critical. Uh, oh, sorry, then I maybe should skip the anastylosis or I'll talk about anastylosis. We have an uh, anastylosis project. 1987 to 90. This is the tetrapylon. The tetrapylon we did in a way uh, with the role model of the we've seen before. The, this is a standing columns in situ with a, and the arch with two keystones. The building is from the second century AD, but underneath one of these columns was a a coin from the 4th century, so it was actually rebuilt. Uh, we had then, uh, this was our role model, the Celsus Library in Ephesus, and this is the, say, uh, the uh, tetrapylon. Uh, one big difference, our first anastylosis, in order to keep all these heavy tons on the columns, we had to drill each column through into the foundation, 1 meter 60. And these, each four columns make a table and all this weight is just shifted on top and secured. This is a way how we looked at anastylosis in the 80s. We would not do this today. And this is what I would like to show now. Immediately after the tetrabylon, we did the sebasteon. The sebasteon is a completely different anastylosis. We used the least uh, invasive methods. We have no steel used, only uh, stainless steel. This is the Sebasteon itself. It has, this is a rendering. And the next anastylosis was the, this is a construction picture, the Sebasteon. And the anastylosis, the last one was the Propylon, which is a two-story building. Now, in the thoughts of the 80s, we would have drilled all columns through and put them up. What we really did, we saw twice. This is what we achieved. And the second story, we will build up separately beside and leave it open to further generations, maybe to put it up again or not. Uh, tiny capital on financing. Uh, in the time of Canonarium, Financing excavation running aside was difficult as today. We know that National Geographic Society spent some money, New York University, and private donors who came to visit and Canon with his own money. Today, this is no more possible. In order to get a project funded nowadays, you have to have a complete project. You have to show what you want to reach with a place like this and what you can achieve. It has to be uh, in a timely manner and projects longer than four or five seasons are very hard to finance unless you make it in stages.
but this is leading to another question, maintenance and repair. Where are we going? How to proceed with destroying, not destroying heritage and damages for future generations? Maintenance means more than presenting a clean site. Maintenance means taking care of all restored and conserved buildings on the site, sometimes also at the artifacts in the museum, and the excavated areas. Maintenance in aphrodisias cannot stand alone. There are goals we need to achieve. I'm skipping the goals now. We want like to make the city accessible, repair, make it accessible on these red and blue lines, which are, we are working on. And these are the pictures. Dialogue. May I say a little bit about dialogue? None of these goals can be reached without a dialogue. We started in the late 80s before during the anastylosis on a small basis, meanwhile became a regular event during season. Beside individual visits of team members from other excavations, Aphrodisias takes part in the annual conservation restoration meeting for excavation teams from the Asia Minor West Coast area, first initialized by the team of Bergamon. The aim is to see, to discuss and ask about recent methods of uh, restorations. And next year it will be, I'm um, proud to say, in Aphrodisias. Not to be underestimated is the factor of local labor. These are the people who are living in the closest vicinity, and this is our team, 2019 team. They are working there and they're spending all their lives there. Our workers carry a treasure, a treasure of knowledge with them, sometimes passed from generation to generation. Important to let them part in is what we are doing to take them around the site, explain the site, and sometimes go on a two days trip with them to another site. This brings motivation for their work. Last. Also important and not neglected to keep the site interesting for students and local schools and universities. Regular visits of children with their teachers are common. A different approach is to attract the site to young people with workshops or the offer to helping us in summer during the campaign. Since 2018, Aphrodisias has yearly summer camps for children between 8 to 14 years, sponsored by the Koch Foundation. For 30 days, about 20 children each day from a different area come to our site, supervised by two teachers. A walk through the site, the museum and contact to the excavation team are on a daily program. A sandbox imitates earth where first attempts of digging can be tried. As a conclusion, I hope that I've been able to show the major differences in financing, managing restoring a large antique site now in comparison to what occurred in older days. We have big chances in technical possibilities, communication and dialogue. However, we should never neglect the factor of time. As I showed you with the example of the shifted column of the Temple of Aphrodite, it took us 100 years just to keep a column standing upright. On that note, in terms of the future, I remain very positive. Thank you. Um, our last uh, speaker for this session is um, Gwiliz Bilgin Altenos. Uh, she's um, uh, she's an as associate professor uh, well in cultural heritage conservation at uh, Middle East Technical University and uh, well uh, she has a background in restoration architectural restoration and architecture and uh, she's a member of the ECOMOS Turkey National Committee uh, and uh, she's interested in conservation conservation theory heritage conservation management uh, planning of historical and architectural, architectural landscapes. So today, uh, her talk is titled The UNESCO World Heritage Brand, a tool or a threat for the conservation of archaeological heritage in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you. After listening to all these interesting uh, examples from different heritage, archaeological heritage places, which are UNESCO World Heritage sites also in Turkey,
once more. Uh, I'll now uh, a little bit focus on uh, the pros and cons of being in the list of UNESCO, uh, which is, I mean, for a long while, which is under discussion for different types of sites all over the world. So uh, also we can discuss this issue for uh, World Heritage Sites from Turkey as well. Well, uh, first of all, in that presentation, I'll try to give you my own conceptual approach to heritage places, including also archaeological sites. And then I'll uh, focus on the uh, relation of archaeology, tourism, and conservation, and then uh, the global organizations and their impacts on such uh, heritage places, and then UNESCO World Heritage as a brand, uh, together with its pros and cons, I would like to discuss as the final part of it. Well, then we're talking about any place. Uh, we, uh, the first thing is, first of all, we have the nature. And together with that nature, which is in fact the setting, the resource also, the um, built environment, we have also the life there, the people there, and that life and people are the generators in that setting, together with all these resources, and they all together, together with other agents, uh, together with the context, sociocultural, economic, political, legal, administrative, and agents like culture, beliefs, morals, traditions, values, tastes, lifestyles, uses, needs, expectations, priorities, productions, abilities, economy, politics, ideology, laws, administration, and all, they create the living environment, the place itself. So the living environment is an outcome of all the uh, interaction of all these things. And uh, as a result, we have the final product, which is living, which have life and spirit also in, in itself. Uh, however, we can say that there is another important thing, which is time, and that time changes. Uh, it's the mighty sculpture, uh, also mentioned in literature, and it changed many of the things there. It changed the uh, nature also, life and people, uh, the agents, the context, everything, and as a result, the living context also changes in time. And then we have that changing product in our hands with its patinas and lacunas with the uh, things included to that place in time and also excluded from there in time as well. And as a result of this, sometimes these places lose all their life and people and their connection with the people, but sometimes they, are, they convert themselves, adapt themselves to new lives as well, together with the people and the context. And at that point, uh, when we see those places, we can have uh, interest towards those past places, places produced by the, uh, those people, nature, and interaction of different agents in time. And uh, that kind of interest, of course, occurred very early. I mean, it's not a recent interest. It, uh, it was, uh, it, um, it always happened, but especially starting from the 16th century onwards, we can say that there was an interest towards following the traces of the past, traces of the past civilizations, and which then returned into an interest towards revealing the traces of the past civilizations, and also collecting the traces of past civilizations for uh, prestige as well. And as a result of it, again, as an early attempt, we can say that those uh, pieces of past civilizations have always been something important uh, and interested, interesting, and so they had been an object for marketing as well and branding, even in early periods. So uh, when we, uh, these past places, when they have, uh, they are, uh, when a kind of a curiosity interest occurs towards them, and when they are find valuable, they are called heritage as that period onwards, and becoming a heritage is another, in fact, uh, changing agent in their lives as well. And when they become heritage, they are subject to conservation and management studies, which change many other things as well. Well, uh, these conservation and uh, management studies create, in fact, uh, the, a new meaning to uh, give a new meaning to the place and give a new life also, and they are they make them a kind of a new construct as well. They reshape the place as well. I would like to uh, quote the word of Frank Matero, who says, 
uh, archaeological sites are made, not found, which also shows how we are reshaping the places we are finding, the past places, with our new interventions. Well, uh, this kind of an interest towards the past uh, was always valid, but uh, especially after the Second World War, after uh, big scale destructions all over the world, uh, we can talk about the uh, foundation of international organizations for peace of the humanity as well, including UNESCO uh, in 1945, and then onwards with UNESCO, ICOMOS, ICROM, uh, Council of Europe and so, we can see that the uh, international organizations started to be an agent in conserving for the conservation of places, heritage places as well. And at that point, we can see that in 1972, the declaration of uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Convention is a very important point at that, uh, in that timeline establishment of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee and the World Heritage List with a, uh, as a global effort to document and conserve the places of outstanding universal interest. So on that period onwards, we can say that not only being a heritage, but also being a heritage, which is universally important, became another important issue, changing the life of those places and a real new intervention to those places as well. Well, UNESCO World, being UNESCO World Heritage brings a lot of things. First of all, it is a very prestigious issue to say that we have something universally important, universally uh, having a universal outstanding value. Uh, it becomes in time a brand also because uh, it increases the interest towards those places and as a result, it becomes a kind of a brand uh, in, uh, for those places. It has also other impacts, of course, like increasing the consciousness, because increasing the attraction of the people, also the local people and the nations as well, to the places that they have, have a positive impact uh, in increasing the consciousness towards conservation. And uh, it also provides economic benefit, of course, uh, through mainly tourism, again, basically due to that increasing interest towards those places. In this, we can see that especially uh, becoming a brand and economic brand, uh, benefit be, uh, becomes one of the most important among the, all the others as well. And this uh, UNESCO World Heritage brand, uh, together with that global curiosity, interest and value, increases the culture tourism, of course, in those places, uh, which where you can go and see the outstanding universal values, specificities and spirit of those places. Uh, this can be, on one hand, a positive thing. However, on the other hand, it can create some problems as well. Uh, now we have a lot of um, marketing strategies towards world heritage places so that more people can go, more people can visit them, and so more money can be gained over it, especially for na in national and local level, local decision makers and na national decision makers, for them it becomes quite an important issue. And this is also valid for archaeological sites. They can really cause problems in such sites. This is an example from China. I, uh, as you know, uh, when you enter the site, you cannot even feel that spirit of the place or the sense of the place, but you feel as if you're going in a uh, shopping mall place uh, outside the city, which is in fact the, the terracotta soldiers in China receiving a lot of visitors and so structured also in order to visit more and more visitors as well. This happens in other places as well, all over the world. It is a discussion and uh, even sometimes this can cause some uh, change in policies as well. The, especially the central and local governments can direct their po policies towards uh, gaining more money over the same heritage place. So consuming more and more the same place. Uh, Colosseum is a case for this, I can say. Uh, recently, as um, perhaps most of you know as well, the upper floor uh, is, will be restored. Uh, it's announced that it will be restored. 
uh, saying that, declaring that, they're restoring it because the, originally it was like that, but on the other side of it, we know that, also the scholars from Italy say that, they are doing this because they will uh, get money for both entities to the upper level and the lower level. So it becomes a subject of economic benefits more and more. And uh, especially in urban areas, this becomes really disturbing. The increasing amount of tourism, cultural tourism, can really relate, uh, make people discomfortable in that state. And because of this, uh, there are a lot of discussions going on all over the world saying, is UNESCO killing the things it loves? Yes, uh, it's a, a, the other side of the coin. Uh, there are some opposite uh, negative impacts of being in the list of UNESCO. And now recently, there are a lot of efforts also towards uh, minimizing those negative impacts, especially due to tourism, limiting the tourist number of tourists to the places and so. And so uh, at the moment, even though it's more brand and economic benefit than tourism, now it is turning out to be, the discussions are about uh, focusing more on its prestige, but also co uh, increasing the consciousness and conservation and sustainability of it, of, of those places. And demarketing is emerging as another uh, new concept in such places, instead of increasing the people coming, uh, decreasing the interest towards those places. In Turkey also, we have the impacts of these places. Uh, all over the world, as you know, starting from 1972 onwards, now uh, there is more than 1,000 places inscribed to the list. So the discussion, uh, there's a, a, an experience over which we can make all these discussions, we can see the outcomes of all uh, the inscriptions. In Turkey, uh, we have 18 places inscribed, uh, as you know, and th those inscri inscriptions started with uh, the acceptance of the convention in 1983. And from 18, 1983 onwards, we have 18 places. But they're increasing more and more. We have more than 70 places, 78 places in the tentative list right now. And every place we go, uh, the uh, local authorities are always asking uh, to, in uh, to be included into the list because they really find UNESCO as a support for economic um, problems, a way to solve the economic problems of the, uh, the country as well. Uh, when Pergamon was in, uh, inscribed in the list as well, it, was re it really uh, had a lot of um, impacts. Uh, and they, they were very, really happy. Many people were very happy about that inscription. And you can see how Pergamon people were happy as well that night when they heard about the inscription of the place. Uh, and also the uh, mayor said that uh, more tourists will be coming to Bergama so that uh, uh, following this we'll change all the Kale castle parts and the tissue into more accommodation uh, for tourists, like a kind of a guest hall to the tourists, to the outsiders again. Uh, and at that point, it was the uh, time for Ephesus. Now Ephesus is in the list as well. So uh, when we turn back to the discussion of how these places ha are uh, occurring, uh, they have their own super. Uh, they have they uh, each of them have their own specific specificities. I couldn't say I'm sorry. And uh, however, when uh, they become a world heritage place, there are different impacts of becoming in the list. First of all. The, uh, perhaps one of the most discussed one is about tourism that I have already mentioned. However, the other one is about, together with increasing interest, also the interest towards conservation increases, uh, sometimes just to make them better look for the people coming uh, as well. Uh, so some strategies are developed to uh, present them, uh, present all these places. However, in their presentation, we sometimes lose their specific issues and put all uh, um, uh, the same kind of material, the same kind of presentation to each of them uh, without considering their own spirit and importance. This was the case in Turkey. As you know, uh, the traverses were used for the presentation of archaeology, uh, as a part of the presentation of archaeological sites in Sagalosos, in uh, Pergamon, in Nemrut, in Göbekli Tepe, 
it doesn't matter where it is. It is used everywhere in the same way, and that was all. The second uh, main discussion ongoing uh, all around the world is about the locals and locals' ideas about this and the impact of inscription on the local life. And at that point, we can say that archaeological sites are not places isolated from uh, the life and local uh, the things going on all around. Sometimes they are already within the uh, settled areas, urban or rural, uh, but sometimes they're at the vicinity of them. And all, there is always somebody in relation with that. So we're not talking just about a place, but place and people, which in fact created those places in time. And now we are uh, having some limitations on those people. We are uh, putting some limitations on their activities as well, including their even entrances to those places. Uh, this is the one from Aphrodisias. It's not just because uh, it's a uh, World Heritage Site. When uh, its, uh, cha its status changed to a heritage place to be conserved, then some limitations come. Some of them are, they, they should come, of course, but we have to think about how their impacts as well on the other side. And uh, their relation with the people change. This is Stratonikeia, where people were living and there was life. Uh, whereas now it is an archaeological site. This is from Ephesus, where children were using Ephesus as a um, schoolroom in a way, not uh, time to time going there and uh, making their presentations there. Now, uh, of course, we are again calling children to do something, but we are inviting them inside. Previously, it was their place. They were going and it was normal to be there. Besides, uh, especially in Ephesus, there was a thesis study which revealed that uh, there were a lot of memories in the archaeological uh, site which are lost after the heritage status. And uh, I'm sure it will be more limited now after the world heritage status, like Hydrales uh, festivals within the site, like the uh, camel wrestling uh, within the archaeological site. And so these were the routines, the daily uh, daily and seasonal uh, routines of the people living there, and their relation with the place becomes uh, loosened in time. Thank you. Also, in other places which are on the list to be inscribed, like uh, Minas, the upper living layer is now to, uh, almost totally cleared of the Ottoman uh, tissue in order to reveal the more important outstanding universal part of it, which is the tomb of the Hecatomnus. And however, some, uh, there are some interesting things as well for the case of Turkey, different than the world. Even though all over the world we know that uh, there's a real increase in mass tourism uh, together with the inscription to World Heritage List, we, uh, we made a study on uh, Pergamon to see the impacts of the uh, being inscribed, and it revealed that we, we didn't have those impacts, in fact. Uh, we didn't have increase in tourism because each country has its, its own local dynamics as well, especially in the last years because of the terrorism, because of the uh, economic things or strategies that the governments uh, have given uh, about transportation. They all uh, caused the limitation of the tourist, uh, tourists coming to those places. So it's not that much important, perhaps, for the case of Turkey, still controllable to a level. But especially uh, we, uh, in our strategies, we can see that the uh, relation of the local people with the uh, place is the main problem about the places. And we can say that UNESCO World Heritage Site, I mean, uh, the main, we have to discuss, in fact, uh, the three different levels, global, national, and local. And uh, in fact, we are uh, experiencing tensions and sometimes compressions among those uh, different levels and layers. Uh, for example, UNESCO is a global brand. It, it, it is also uh, becoming a UNESCO World Heritage, is also becoming a national heritage, so it has national impacts. But it is a local place with local context as well that we have uh, to keep in mind always. Besides, uh, it is always being a, in the list, brings especially nationally a prestige, uh, but also locally as well. Uh, however, due to its uh, be having universal, outstanding universal value, even the conservation uh, attitudes and policies uh, 
start to be more towards that universal value instead of the other local values that the place already have as well. So we start losing uh, the other ones. Economic benefits is always at the main concern and mass tourism is the most important one perhaps. At that point we cannot say that, I mean I cannot suggest many things as have to do, but we have to be aware of these pros and cons so that we can direct and manage the future attitudes, uh, thinking that we'll have more and more places in the list in the future. Uh, we have to get prepared to that. And in that sense, uh, for the archaeological heritage, uh, we are talking about archaeological researches, excavations, tourism, conservation planning, but there is also the living context as well, and it's in between all these things. And when it becomes a world heritage as well, they are all together. And so at the very center, we have the place, as mentioned before, but not only the place, place together with people at the center, and we all the others and all the other activities are supporting this, uh, are the parts of this. And it's very important to be uh, able to come together around the same focus, that archaeological place and the people living there, uh, by creating common, common language, sharing the values, understanding values, decisions as well, dialogue, participation, consensus building, democracy and transparency can be tools to do that. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker um, is uh, my colleague and um, my, not my office mate, but my office neighbor. Um, her office is next to mine. Um, although I, I don't get to see her very much anymore. She's a busy lady. Um, so Ch uh, it's my pleasure um, to introduce um, Chedem Maner. She holds a PhD from the University of Heidelberg, and she's currently an assistant professor um, here in the Department um, of Archaeology and History of Art. Um, since 2013, she's been the director of the Konya Erli Use Oh dear, survey I project. Oh, yes, okay, <laughs> um, uh, which aims to survey the Bronze Age and Iron Age settlements of the southeastern districts of Konya. Um, she's also the co-director of the Kamankalahiuk excavations led by the Japanese Institute um, of Anatolian Archaeology. And she has been absolutely instrumental um, in work with uh, Iraqi, Italian, and German colleagues for curriculum redesign of archaeology in Iraq. Um, and this also has been linked to her ongoing field work there. Her publications are vast, and they include recently published monographs on the comparative study of Mycenaean and Hittite fortifications in several edited volumes, book chapters, and journal articles, far too numerous for me to list here. Um, today she will discuss um, the interaction of survey, history, and management of cultural landscapes um, in Konya. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank um, the organizers, Nirgen Oz and Christina Luke, for inviting me to this symposium to share my experience on attempts of cultural heritage preservation. And after listening uh, to the first two talks, mine is more of a uh, case study because it was uh, more general what we listened to before. My presentation is about a village called Ivris, which is located on the slopes of the Bolkar Mountains in uh, the south of the Konya Plain. Um, the village and its surroundings are the location of Hittite, Byzantine, and industrial cultural heritage, which are all related to a spring and are nourished by the water. During the 2015 survey season of the Konya Edele survey project, major threats towards the cultural uh, and natural habitat, uh, habitat were observed, which have led uh, to the development and implementation of a variety of heritage projects, which I will introduce and discuss in detail. My presentation is divided in four sections. First, I will provide a brief overview of the archaeological research in and around Ivris to underline the significance. Secondly, I will discuss the threats and problems on the site, which have been initiated, uh, which have initiated the various heritage projects. Then I will explain why and how the um, application for the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Tentative List was prepared and what the outcomes are. After that, I will discuss the site management plan, landscaping, and rural regeneration projects. 
Ivrez is located 170 kilometers southeast of the Konya province and 2.9 kilometers south of the provincial town of Halkapunar. Um, sorry, I lost my way. The village, which has around 80 inhabitants in winter, is settled at 1,200 meters above sea level on the slopes of the Bokar Mountains. The average age is between 65 and 70. The main income of the local community is based on fruit farming, drying fruits and vegetables for the winter, and preparing molasse from grapes. The region is famous for apple, grapes, and white cherries. The majority of the population of Ivris has moved mainly to Erela and Konya, which offer more employment and better education opportunities for their children. Ivris, which is also known as Aydin Kent, got its name from the famous spring. Vrisi in Greek means spring and was, was adapted as Ivris into Turkish. The village is situated next to the spring Ivris, which is here. Um, from around mid-April to mid-August each year, water bubbles off the ground. The amount of the water which comes out of the ground is related to the quantity of snowfall each year in the Taurus Mountain. The snowmelt carries big quantities of water and has been creating marshes in the Irela bore plain and feeding Akgöl. The water comes off the ground in several places and they shift because of the Karakstik territory. Just a few meters east of the relief is a cave um, where the water bubbles between the rocks and this is also the spot where the Ivris Creek starts. Ivris is famous for the rock relief depicting um, storm god Tarhunzas and King Varpalavas along with inscriptions in hieroglyphic Luvian dating to the 8th century BC. However, nowadays the cool and sweet waters are the major attraction uh, for people from all over, such as Konya, Adana, Mersin, Nida, and Karaman, uh, who come to picnic here, especially in uh, July and August, when certain regions are unbearable hot. The earliest remains dating to the early Bronze Age, which were discovered during our field season in 2015, indicate that a small settlement was located on the western slope of the rock relief. The relief is here, and that's the settlement. A fort known by the locals as Dipek Kalesi, located at 1,803 meters above sea level, is located around three and a half kilometers southeast of Ivris on the hills of the Bokar Mountains. The pottery collected here dates to the Middle, Late, Bronze Ages, Iron Ages, and Roman period. Information gained from oral history with the villages, and particularly this man here, um, who went with donkeys from Ivris down to Tarsus to sell fruits until 20 years ago, shows that Dibek Kalesi is located on the main road over the Bokar Mountains via Chamliyayla down to Tarsus. There are also some images taken by Gertrude Bell about um, this from our library collection. Um, according to the merchant, it took him two and a half to three days to walk down to Tarsus, and on his way back it took him only two days as the donkey didn't have any heavy cargo to carry. To the east of Dibek Kalesi, remains of several more forts have been um, discovered uh, and systematically surveyed. All of them are controlling these descents to the Konya Plain and shed light on road networks connecting the Konya Plain with the Mediterranean region. As the southeastern part of the Konya Plain was marshy until the Ivris Dam was built in the 1980s, majorly uh, to prevent floodings, the road along the mountain range was the safest road for the animals carrying cargo so that they don't sink into the mud. The Hittites who defied springs, springs, caves, and ponds, uh, which they saw as a connection to the netherworld, must have been aware of Ivris when they conquered the cities of the lower land, such as Tuvanua, Hupishna, Lusna, and Landas. David Hawkins recently argued that Ivris is uh, the Dinger Kashkalkur, the so-called sinkhole mentioned in the treaty between Tutalia IV and Kurunta, written on a bronze tablet. Ivris in the second millennium BC must have been impressive and difficult to reach. It was probably like a lake and marshy and must have struck the attention of the Hittites. Hence, it is obvious why the settlements are all located on elevated areas from the early Bronze Age onwards. 
The sculpture will remain in Ives date mainly to the Iron Age. Besides the famous rock relief, three fragments of inscribed blocks with hieroglyphic Luvian, uh, the lower part of a stele depicting probably the storm god and the half of a head of a colossal sculpture, likely depicting Varpalavas, have been discovered. These uh, stele inscribed in Luvian and Phoenician um, is similar to the ones in Karatepa Azatibotaya. The head is a part of a monumental sculpture. Examples are known from examples uh, such as Malate Aslantepe, uh, Karatepe, Zinjirli, Gerchen, and Ayn Arab. Just north of the cave on top of a rock, a second relief had been discovered by Lionel Beer and his wife in the 1970s, which is depicting a sacrifice scene. The relief is carved on an outcrop facing the north. An officer is pulling a sheep by his horn and, his, uh, and in front of him, the fringe of a coat of a second person is visible. The royal Hittite inscriptions from the period of Arnavandas I for the Belmat Galti, the frontier officers, describe such scenes. They are instructed to keep the sp springs clean, perform offerings, and visit them regularly. The relief has been broken by looters and was carried to the Ereli Museum a few years ago. Just above the scene, a few steps lead uh, to rectangular intendation, which was likely the foundation of an inscribed stele. Similar ones had been discovered by the late Aykut Chunarola in the Kashlik Valley in Nide. The stele in Ivris must have been visible from afar while approaching the site. Down the rock, a small rectangular building is leaning against the rock. It is covered with a vault. It's known as Turbe by locals, and they are binding colored uh, cloth pieces to its door. However, there is no tomb inside. Down the rock, oh, sorry, the foundation uh, is made of large uh, rocks and cyclopean masonry, which could have be, could have uh, could even date uh, to the late Bronze Age. The rock has severe uh, water marks. Uh, which show that the water was running down the rocks. Maybe there was a waterfall. Still today, in spring, water comes out of the, from the bottom of the rock. This must be also be the reason why the Hittites had carved the offering scene on top of this rock. As Ivris was also important during the Byzantine period, it was maybe used also, also as a small chapel during late antiquity. Around two and a half kilometers to the south of Ivris, inside a valley which is known as Ambarderese, a smaller version of the Ivris relief is located. It takes about 50 minutes to climb up the valley, as it is very difficult to walk on the rocky riverbed. A creek was flowing. Here nowadays, there is no water. Um, there are small differences in the garments and headgear, um, and it doesn't have any inscription. This is very well visible in 3D scannings, which were conducted in 2015. Uh, during a visit in 2016 for the landscaping project, the architect found a fragment of an inscribed stele in hieroglyphic Luvian among thousands of rocks in the riverbed in Ambarderese. This is a major and exceptional find, as so far no inscriptions were known from Ambarderese, and it indicates that also inscribed steles in hieroglyphic Luvian were situated in Ambarderese, like Ivris. Across and also next to the relief, the buildings of the Byzantine monastery, known as Palace of Boys and Girls, by locals are built along the slopes. These are the remains of the Sana Badaye Monastery, which was one of the centers for ascetic monks uh, of Laconia during the 4th century AD and onwards. Still remains of fresco paintings, which even can be seen here on the slide, um, are visible. The monastery was located here because it must have had a fame as a sacred place, as the church is just across the Hittite relief. Unfortunately, the monastery gets destroyed every year more and more through illicit excavations. Just 15 meters to the north of the church, the entrance of a cave is visible. This cave was investigated in 2017 together with amateur speleologues. The cave is 50, uh, 70 meters long and the deepest part is 12 meters deep. A mug dating to the Middle Iron Age in the Ereli Museum, which you see on the slide, was brought from here. As the pit was covered with the bad excrements, only a few shards could be discovered, but among them were parts of a, late, uh, of a Middle, Bronze, uh, Middle Iron Age uh, jar. At the end, 
at the entrance of the cave, a libation hole is situated, which you see here. Libation holes are known from various Hittite sites, uh, such as Fraktum, Boasco, Beiko, and also around the Marmara uh, Lake region. The Hittites were pouring liquids, such as oil and beer, in front of the gods, as you can see from the example uh, from Fraktum. As mentioned before, caves and springs are associated with the netherworld, so the whole setting here in Ambar Derese and Ivris is related to cultic activities, and the netherworld and the sculptures, inscriptions, and steles indicate that there was a small open-air sanctuary. A long durée of the meaning and function of the place can be observed until the late antiquity. The indigenous landscape, physical landscape in Ivris, where the relief is, was transformed to create water pools and canals for a hydroelectric uh, power plant in Ivris and Irele during the 1930s. A hydroelectric power plant was built in Ivris to produce electricity for the Sumerbank textile factory. The rock where the relief is carved was drilled here. Here's the relief, it was drilled here. And water canals from Ivris to Ereli were built to lead the water to the second hydroelectric power plant inside the Sumerbank textile factory. This is the time when the indigenous physical landscape was transformed. What a visitor sees today upon a visit in Ivris are these water pools and remains of the industrial heritage from the 1930s. Before that transformation, Ivris was a beloved picnic spot where visitors were dining in front of the relief. During our survey in 2015, major threats, uh, threats to the natural and archaeological heritage were observed. Balloon shooting next to the main relief and under the second relief, um, parking problems, grilling meat and corn and boiling tea just in front of the relief, creating smoke and fire, huge garbage piles left behind the picnickers, and mass tourism. Limited car parking areas blocking the roads also were another problem. Uh, beer bottles and broken glass on the relief itself, um, unallowed constructions within the protected archaeological areas, huge security threats, illicit excavations, and digging new roads into the mountains so that people could access Ambar Derese without walking and so forth. Furthermore, the villagers who see the picnicers as their uh, major income were selling molasse, jam, and other consumable goods in unhygienic conditions. The jam, for example, was filled in the jars they just had used before for tomatoes, or the molasse was filled in small plastic water bottles, which they just drank before using them. As described before, Ivris is a sacred place and holy place, especially during the Hittite period and late antiquity, and this was an unacceptable condition. All of these led to initiate projects to enhance local and international awareness about Ivris and its cultural landscape. As Ivers was used majorly as a picnic spot and the archaeological heritage was neglected and not acknowledged and honored by locals and visitors, it was important to create awareness of the archaeological heritage at first hand. I decided to write an application for Ivers to be included in the UNESCO's World Heritage Tentative List. UNESCO is con considered a brand nowadays, and also we had some presentations today for heritage protection, awareness, and also cultural tourism, even if the function and meaning of it is very debated. In 2015, majorly monuments and archaeological sites from Turkey were on the main and on the tentative world heritage list, and only two mixed sites, Göreme National Park and rock sites of Cappadocia and Hierapolis Pamukkale were included. As Ivris does not only consist of a Hittite, of a neo-Hittite rock relief, but also uh, all kind of other monuments, industrial heritage, and the springs, the mountains, shortly its natural and cultural landscape, I decided to include all of them into the application which I called Ivris Cultural Landscape, so, to, so that it had also a higher chance uh, to get accepted. UNESCO's uh, selection criteria 2, 3, and 4 were the main criteria for Ivris cultural landscape. However, in 2016, Turkey had already too many sites for the inscription to the tentative list application, hence my application to the Ministry of Culture and Tourism General Directorate of Cultural Heritage and Museums was rejected. 
I tried my chance at the beginning in 2007 again, and with the strong support of Yildirim Inan from the general director, great, uh, was sent my application to the National UNESCO Committee in Ankara and then uh, to Paris. In April 2017, Ivry's cultural landscape was included in the tentative World Heritage List together with Ivolic industrial landscape and archaeological site of Assos. After the inscription, Ivers got more attention for its cultural heritage, which was neglected before, in the local and national press, and interested tourists, especially from Turkey, started to visit the site more frequently. In fall 2015, I was able to get a grant which would enable landscaping, site management, and rural regeneration projects. These significant projects, projects were initiated to create awareness among villagers to protect and understand the site, their site. The protection of rural sites has increasingly become, in de become dependent on tourism uh, in places where there is significant archaeological heritage, public and community archaeology forms a strong bridge between the local community through archaeology uh, to become wider part of a culture. In this sense, it was important to work on a site management plan with a target to manage the site that remains entirely in situ over a long time span. The site management plan was initiated at the same time as the landscaping project in November 2015. The idea was to prepare a site management plan where all of the stakeholders would be included to create a sustainable way of preservation and management for the site for future generations. With the landscaping project, an open-air archaeology park was envisioned where a visitor center and education space, visitor paths, labeling, and replicas of the inscriptions, steles, reliefs, and sculptures would be exhibited in situ. Furthermore, the landscaping project was going to solve parking problems, tourist and garbage control. For me, it was important that the site management and the landscaping project started at the same time and continue parallel to each other as they would complete each other. Since the aforementioned demonstrated threats are serious problems and the local communities and state offices are not really aware of them and don't also know how to handle them, it was inevitable. Hence, um, the Everest Rock, Hittite Rock Monument and Water Springs Castle Landscape, uh, Landscape Site Management Plan uh, had been initiated. A group of scholars from various fields such as geology, economy, tourism, hydrology, architects, archaeology, art historians, and so on, uh, started to prepare a site management plan. A first site visit was conducted where also all of the official bodies had been visited in Konya, Hakka, Punar, and Ereli to gather the necessary information. However, with an official decision of the Ministry of Culture, um, on August 4, 2016, our site management project was terminated. The reason which was demonstrated in the letter was that the preparation of a site management plan for archaeological sites is only reserved for the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Furthermore, it was stated that in order to control the financial resources, the sites which are chosen by the Ministry for a Site Management Project preparation are sites which are on the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Tentative List and we were asked to terminate it. Uh, we hadn't used any resources of the ministry, however, Ivis was not on the tentative list at that time. The outcome of the site management project was a 167-page recommendation report, which included all of the first conducted research and recommendation for a future site management plan. Um, at the same time with the site management plan project, the landscaping project was initiated. I had conducted intensive research on architectural companies and uh, who works on archaeological sites and decided to uh, work with Atelier Mimarlik, who had already experience in central Anatolia with the councils in Konya for their shelter projects in Çatalhöyük and Aşıklıhöyük. The architects first prepared a preliminary plan for the archaeological and natural site and studied the property uh, status. The major plan was prepared for the archaeological site. 
Um, the idea of the landscaping project was to tangle the village with nature and archaeology to open up the view of the springs and the reliefs of the approaching visitor as they had been covered by a ramp, elevations, and parking areas. A visit to center with a view to the main cave, second relief in spring, which is going to explain the history, archaeology, geology, industrial heritage of Iris, um, was going to be uh, built and an education uh, center for children and also for disabled children, as Elele was very famous for its town cafe. Furthermore, visitor past labeling and replicas of the sculptures were going to be um, exhibited in situ. On um, the interesting thing was that actually our project was uh, approved by the Konya um, uh, Cultural Protection Board in May 2017, and the Kaimakam at the time of Halkapunar had a great interest in, um, imp in implementing the project. And two days after the coup on July 17, we went carrying all the models actually from Istanbul by plane to Konya. And Makbule Tarzi, whom you see here on the photo, uh, who was previously <coughs> responsible for projects in the GAP area, decided to give 100% support for the landscaping project implementation. Furthermore, we were able to get support also from the governor of Konya. Um, however, there were problems. Um, after um, our project was granted the money, the municipality of Konya interfered and decided that the money should be transferred to them, and they started uh, to do this project, um, which actually led to the fact that the project never got finished. Um, so there was a bit, and after the first bit, there was nobody actually who wanted to join the bit, apparently. And during the second bit, they gave the bit to somebody who was constructing road and who was already working with the municipality. However, there was a fallout between the constructor and the municipality, and this is the last stage, unfortunately, and it does not continue. There's a trial right now. Finally, um, I want to talk two minutes actually about the Rural Regeneration Project because it is quite important to support the sustainable tourism and the significant tangible heritage um, such as the continuing village life, local products and production for long-term results and a community archaeology project was started. And um, for that, a association called Ivris Kultur Mirasını Koruma ve Tanıtma Derni was founded, and we rented a house for that, which we have uh, restored. This is before and after. And uh, the main aim, actually, of that uh, association is to research, archive, and uh, to conduct oral history, and to work also on the sustainable life of ecotourism and uh, these kind of uh, topics. I'm trying to finish because I don't, I know I don't have time. So uh, this is how the house was looking like before. Also, we wanted to underline the value actually of traditional mud brick houses, as people want to see that instead of uh, concrete houses. And uh, this is how it looked after the restoration. This uh, house is only uh, used by women and only for uh, village women to work here and to prepare jam and uh, to gather. We conducted oral history also to collect all of the cultural memory from the village. As I said, there are not many people anyway. And in the last three years, we already have ten, lost 10 uh, people. So the oral history still continues and hopefully it will be published next year by uh, Koch University Press. Yes, so uh, one of the other aims also is to um, collect the architectural values um, of the village. And here you see some images of the women gathering and working inside the houses. We have taught them also on packaging. As I said, there were unhygienic conditions for the jam. We did uh, packaging sessions, how they could package their own things and sell it better. And we had an industrial kitchen installed inside the traditional house where they actually can cook together the jam and also sell it later on if they like. We have taught them actually how to prepare breakfast uh, to welcome tourists. And also we try to enhance view new ways actually of using their traditional designs to produce uh, beautiful children uh, clothes and also socks. Yes, so the cherries are famous, as I've mentioned before, so the yellow cher cherries are also part 
of that. And also we had invited several scholars to work with them, um, for example, on soap making. And we tried to revive also the mud brick and we had a mud brick project with them. And you can also visit the website of um, the association and listen also to all the oral histories we have conducted. So it has a huge archive there. Yeah, and there are many things to do. And um, for example, we would like to continue the education programs and uh, we would like to work also on tracking roads. And we will continue. And as a final note, I have to say that, I would like to say that this presentation actually was not easy to write because I'm very emotional and sensitive about the whole project as we had so faced so many serious obstacles and problems and we still continue to face them. And I thought actually a long time if I really would like to present our work with all the related problems in Ivris in a public lecture, as most of the issues are very sensitive. However, the notion that this could be a guideline for examples um, for other projects made me decide to present it here. And I'm not alone, there are so many people I have to thank. It's not enough to um, fill pages. And also our sponsors uh, who have been supporting this project in the last three years. And three people I want to thank especially who have worked actually with the women and on the rural regeneration project, Salia Menter, Sadia Kaya, and Inge Mary Tasha. Thank you. All right, um, our final paper um, for the afternoon um, is a co-authored paper. Um, and so I will introduce, you're speaking first. Okay, all right. Um, so I have the opportunity to introduce both, which I'll do now um, consecutively, and then turn the floor over to Omer. Um, so Omer Haman Shah holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He's an associate professor of art history at the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Art and Art History. His current research focuses on the history of landscapes in the Middle East and the politics of ecology, place, and heritage um, in the age of the Anthropocene. He is the principal investigator for the two-year multi-year institutional collaborative um, project entitled Political Ecology as Practice a regional approach to the Anthropocene, which is supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And he's also a current Onomet Fellow here. Um, his co-author is Parrot Johnson. Where is she? There she is. Um, she holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she's currently a visiting professor in the School of Art and History of Art at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and her archaeological research has been divided between northern Turkey and the Konya province. Um, and together, um, they work um, under the Yalbert Yalisa Archaeological Landscape uh, Research Project, um, where Omer is the director and Perry is the field director. Thank you so much, for uh, Christina. And thank you to Nilgun and Christina for, for the mm. invitation and to, uh, to Anna Med. And, and thank you to all of you for staying to the end of the day. So I know it's been a long day. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Are you okay? Yeah. Um, Do you need some? I have some tissue. Can I have some tissue? Can someone grab some tissues? tissues. <laughs> um, I don't have any. Actually, no, I don't have to come out. Does anybody have any? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A little of catastrophe here. It's all right. Just some water. Um, all right. So, um, uh, in our paper, we focus on practices of um, heritage destruction in western districts of Konya province, another Konya project here, but we're in the west, um, and uh, where we've been documenting uh, ancient and historical settlements and um, landscape features. Um, and we've been doing this at the, as uh, Christina mentioned, the Albert Yailas Archaeological Landscape Research Project uh, that uh, we've been running since 2010 in uh, Ulgan and Kadunhane uh, districts here. Um, the primary goal of that project is to compare Holocene Bronze Age landscapes uh, in, under the rule of the Hittite Empire um, compared to the Anthropocene landscapes of post-industrial modernity. Um, what, I will, what we will be uh, presenting today is um, something that belongs to the landscapes of the Anthropocene. 
um, any form of archaeological fieldwork in the Middle East today uh, quickly turns into a salvage operation, as we've seen in many projects like Ebru's presentation or Chi Dam's presentation today. Um, turns quickly into a salvage operation from its very start, whether we like it or not, whether we uh, plan it or not. Um, it, this is because of the extreme. Um, uh, this is, um, this is because of the extreme levels of landscape and heritage destruction that we currently are witnessing in the countryside. Um, we believe that this is a historic moment um, and it will be remembered as such by future generations. Large scale excavations, mining, and disposal of local landscapes under the neoliberal government. Um, uh, <clears throat> under the neoliberal governance and um, extraction, devour sites of cultural heritage, um, uh, including historic buildings, archeological sites and monuments, um, and agricultural and geologic landscapes, uh, which are continuously plundered um, in looting operations. Um, and our, as archeologists, we have a responsibility to be chroniclers of this uh, and witnesses of these unusual times. And this work, must be done uh, in the field. Um, without field work, um, we have no possibility of documenting and intervening in um, heritage destruction while at the same time engaging with the politics of heritage on the ground. Remote sensing projects that attempt to document heritage destruction remain ignorant of and oblivious to uh, the intense local politics of heritage. So keeping an account of um, ongoing heritage violence in the last decade, we've noticed that small scale historic monuments of the medieval and early modern uh, periods, such as district mosques, uh, local rural shrines, and cemeteries have been victims of destruction in, in informal and informal looting operations often performed under the rubric of restoration uh, and in operations carried out with the help of officially acquired treasure hunt excavations, the Fina Kazisa permits. Most of you must have read about the Dipsy's Girl uh, situation, which actually is, uh, is, was really a great example of this kind of how that kind of natural heritage, cultural heritage cannot be really distinguished anymore. There's a big confusion there. Um, and those categories are becoming obsolete. Um, we present the case of, mos of the mosque of um, Pir Hussein Bey, also known as Chukurjami in Ilgan, a 15th century mosque that was stripped down to its foundations through the collaboration of a contractor, academic advisors from a local university, and the local mun municipality, uh, while its late antique and Byzantine spolia were displaced. A common government propagated discourse runs deep among uh, rural communities about such monuments and landscapes of heritage that these monuments and archaeological sites are deemed to be already destroyed um, so that there is no point in trying to resuscitate them. This, um, this demoralizing um, uh, state propagated discourse uh, immobilizes any local resistance to the mutilation of local heritage. We argue that the already destroyed narrative is an extension and an apparatus of a wider strategic regime of heritage destruction in the Turkish countryside today. We further suggest that the officially sanctioned looting operations um, uh, uh, and treasure hunt excavations, particularly the fine are specifically geared towards cleansing the uh, heritage landscape by plundering the sites of non-Muslim pasts, uh, i.e. the architectural remains and material residues um, of non-Muslim and minority communities that remain embedded in the contemporary heritage landscapes of Anatolia. We insist uh, that the politics of heritage destruction in Konya and elsewhere in the Anatolian countryside is intimately linked with the broader crisis of environment, climate change, the new regime of extreme extraction and ecological injustice in rural landscapes of neoliberalism. Um, I also agree with, um, with Amy's paper um, where um, 
uh, the idea of, of that cultural heritage protection is very much related to human rights um, and in, in justice. Um, while surveying in Ilgan in 2015, a Yalbert project team encountered an ongoing restoration project of a 15th century mosque. The mosque is locally known as Chukur Jami as it sits on a lower elevation than the street level today due to changing ground levels. The mosque was built in 1422-23 at the time of Karaman Oler dynasty, sponsored by a certain Pir Hussein Bey of the Turgut Oler clan who politically controlled Ilgan at the time. The mosque, which is currently owned by the General Directorate of Pious Foundations, Vakuflar Genel Müdürlü, had been previously renovated in the 1960s, uh, which had only dealt with consolidating the roof and the top, uh, top meter of the walls. The mosque had solid stone masonry walls that were in excellent condition at the time. In the months of the year in 2013, a renovation project for the mosque was approved by the Regional Preservation Council and contracted out to Shiran Mühendislik Inshat by Konya Vakuflar Bölge Müdürlüğü to be completed by December 2014. The advisor for the project was an art historian from Selçuk University, Professor Ali Boran, who was, um, who was the Dean of the College of Art of Design at that time. During this work, the historic site was fenced with high screens, and both the local community and archaeologists from Akshehir Museum were not allowed to inspect the restoration. We were worried because of, I mean, they were worried because of the presence of the spolia in the, uh, in the building. Once our survey team, which included Nilgun, by the way, um, arrived at the site, and Nilgun will have good remembrance of, of this long day of documenting the site, um, uh, we found out that the stone masonry walls of the mosque were stripped down to their foundations without proper documentation, and the floor of the mosque was excavated without the supervision of archaeologists. Um, uh, the excavation and dismantling revealed more than 200 spolia, uh, reused architectural fragments within its walls and foundations from the Roman Imperial, late antique, and early medieval uh, periods, including uh, carved architectural fragments such as column capitals and blocks with profiles, inscribed and sculpted tombstones, inscribed and carved stele and sarcophagus lids. Spolia, various architectural fragments and archaeological artifacts that were dismantled from the walls as well as timber beams of the mosque um, were piled randomly in various parts of the site. We were informed that the contractors had disappeared uh, in the meantime, abandoning the site without completing the restoration work. And a new firm was contracted to continue and complete the work. Taking advantage of the removal of the corrugated sheet metal walls at this point, the Albert project was able to enter the site and documented 97 spolia fragments with appropriate feature forms, scale photography, and scale drawing on site. During a visit of the consulting art historian, when asked about the fate of the archaeological remains in the mosque, Professor Boran responded that he did not believe there were any archaeological remains um, in the mosque. Um, this documentation work, as well as our concern about the destruction of the mosque walls and precarious state in which its ancient architectural fragments were left, was reported to the State Preservation Council, Vakuflar, and the Ministry of Culture and Tourism in, um, in a report, and um, uh, with all of the drawings, um, uh, site forms, as well as photographs. In various informal conversations, the congregation of the mosque pointed out with great sadness that the mosque had been already destroyed. This is where we learned the term. Um, and that they suggested that it would not matter anymore um, what would be built in place of this mosque. On one of the remaining walls, uh, one small honey-colored marble fragment of a revetment in the upper midst of the northwestern wall had a tiny graffito scratched lightly on its surface, uh, the barely readable writing of shaking hands. It said, Mother of God, help your servants. A few months after our documentation, um, 
uh, actually about a month after our documentation of the reused blocks in the mosque. The remaining stone wall of the building were stripped down uh, further and the stone with the graffiti disappeared without further documentation. This hailing, this resilient call from the 10th to 11th century Byzantine community of Ulgan was erased um, and lost to the explicit maltreatment of historic monuments and cultural heritage within a brutal neoliberal regime. Our politically charged clandestine documentation of Chukur Jami was incorporated into All Have the Same Breath, um, a, a contemporary art exhibition on climate change and the Anthropocene last January in Chicago, um, and, took part in, um, uh, and took part in our team member Boche Drum's installation entitled We Don't Dig. Um, which uh, attempted to bring the experience and politics of uh, being in the field. We don't dig was this expression that we always have to repeat when we were in the field. So it was celebrating that. Um, so I'm going to pass on the microphone to, uh, to Perry, who's going to talk about other aspects of this. Um. So after the mosque had already been destroyed, a second contractor was hired to build a new mosque, Um, with only the Sokol course left intact. Um, the design of the Chukurjami had been that of a particularly modest example of an Ulujami, a columnar hall with a flat roof that reflected back to the fluorescence of Celtic architecture on the central Anatolian plateau of two centuries earlier, but very much a local mosque built by a clan. In its place, Through the Regional Council for the Protection of Cultural Heritage, on which he, he was a member, Ali Baran steered the approval for a design of a new mosque with gray-veined marble columns, a roof resting on brickwork arches, and a dome over the mihrab. Comparison of the silhouette and interior columns of the Alatin mosque and tombs in the Celtic capital of Konya shows how the new Chukurjami is a new imperial Celtic mosque. After restoration, the inhabitants of Olgan, generally with a sad, embarrassed laugh, uh, note that the Chukurjami is now hammam like, like a bath. And clean like a bath, the mosque is now clean of its heritage of resting on the foundations of and being built with the stones of a church and imperial Roman um, monuments. As this Akshahir posted an article from 2016 comments, the community wanted for the mosque uh, back, their mosque, but was surprised by the cross embedded in the wall. Other newspapers had published more inflammatory conspiracies illustrated by this stone. The Roman archaeologist in the room will know that this relief is the frame of a double door with knocker and keyhole. But everyone should note that this article was written a year after the mosque had been dismantled to its sockel course and foundations excavated. So the Albert Project had documented this doorstone in 2015, placed in the recently poured foundations in July, and then summarily tossed into a heap a month later. The removal of these contaminating stones and the hammam-like whitewashing of the mosque, on the one hand, belongs to a long history within colonial archaeology such as the neoclassical sculptor Bertil Thorvaldsen's early 19th century removal of traces of paint on the Egina pedimental sculptures that later became central to the Nazi's Koenigplatz in Munich. In contrast, the cleansed Chukurjami belongs to the whitewashing of the normalized Islam of globalized capitalism, and here I'm referring to the work of Christy Gruber and others. But what is the loss um, for a local memory caused by this architectural cleansing? To investigate how a Christian past is removed to the from the memory of Olgan, let us return to the question of define or treasure hunting permits. The foundation charter of the Tukurjami specifies that the income from a series of Christian villages in the southwest of the Olgan area were to support the mosque. According to its Ottoman Vakfie, Pious Foundation deed from the 15th century, the villages of Yendin, Keshurlu, Bayad, Ruz, Bedug, Alhuru, and some lands of the Ogun town were assigned to support the mosque, 
paying for its maintenance and staffing. In 2013, a treasure permit was issued for a cemetery in Harman Yaza, a village in this area. Obtaining a treasure permit has, has been a simple process that lasts no longer than a couple of weeks. Um, after a government archaeologist has checked the area to ensure that it is not an archaeological site. Permits are generally issued for places where the Ottoman Empire's Christian inhabitants lived and were buried. The foundations and walls of the Chukrudami were likewise excavated by the so-called restorers. And likewise, the restoration is nothing more than a treasure hunting of some of the earliest Islamic architecture in the northwest of Konya province. Chukurjami's restoration followed similar restorations at the Sayyid Harun Jami in another uh, mosque in Sayyidishahir and the Akshahir Ulu Jami, both western Konya districts, that involved excavations of these mosque foundations in a hunt for treasure. These projects are also widely known by the public as scandalous and corrupt renovation projects. We recognize this practice as an ongoing pattern of heritage destruction in the western districts of Konya. These restorations and treasure permits are state-sanctuary appropriation of local land and practice. For example, in the southwest of Ulgin is also a tekke, or small monetary, of Argut Baba, likely named after Agut Han, uh, a town two kilometers to the north, named after a pass, Argut, where it is, uh, where it is located, and the, the Seljuk caravanserai that's built there. In the late 1990s, Argut Baba was restored with the addition of a fence, um, uh, landscaping, new roof, and wall surfaces. And um, it was also incorporated at this time into an early Seljuk, that is around 1200 CE, Turkic colonization and Islamization of the area. Local sacred places without written sources, such as foundation charters, easily enter into national stories. Archaeology can, however, provide an alternate source. The settlement around the monastery building extended to the escarpment to the east, where a spring emerged whose waters were piped to the building, and also along the Chibishli River's edge. The ceramics collected in these areas are Hellenistic and early Roman, and as normal, and later Ottoman, that is, around 16th century onwards possibly dating to the Ottoman resettlement of Argut Hana when the villages of the Chibishli Valley were resettled in town. A few of the tombstones are architectural fragments that attest to the bringing of the residues of abandoned churches to Argut Baba. Although architecturally less destructive than recent restoration in the Ulgan area, the site also suffers from erasure of an Ottoman Christian past, sometimes um, so sometimes vernacular sites are best left as ruins that attest to the deep memories of the inhabitants instead of a fabricated deep history here, that is a Seljuk history, of an Ulgan without re religious diversity. So around the same time, uh, the Teke of Dedi Dede in the southeast of Ulgan district was also restored. Fortunately for this site, perhaps because of its proximity to Beknak and its written connections to the Turgut Olada, uh, archaeologically, the Teke can be clearly connected to the preceding church on the site and its surrounding cemetery, with a few preserved Roman rock cut graves in nearby. So downstream is the tomb of Sungur Bey, contemporary Dedi to Dedi Dede, and therefore another Turgut Olada period shrine and site of visit. According to our conversations with the inhabitants of the nearby village of Isanie, the local community had uh, feasting ceremonies um, at the Turbe on special nights, the midlead of the Islamic tradition. The tombs within this holy place were recently plundered in a devastating looting operation that left the Turbe in a state of ruin. The villagers from Isanie sadly reported that the midlead feast, feast are no longer held at the shrine. At it, as it was already destroyed. But as we have tried to illustrate in this paper, the contemporary practices of heritage violence and heritage injustice 
um, are not, un, not limited to illegal looting operations and plundering, but take place in multiple forms of cleansing, which includes corruption, uh, corrupt restoration projects, and treasure hunting excavations approved by local government. Thank you.